All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 8th, 2023. Uh, we're going to have a good one today. I, you'll probably, well, obviously, you will have already seen the title. I'm playing it off of uh, another brother who had something similar, but with only one year, right? This one is called Messiah 2024, 2030, and 2037. And the focus of this isn't so much for those that have been around for a while, have been following the ministry and the revelations over the years. Um, definitely watch it. You might get new insight. You'll be able to understand where to go to these things in the scriptures to show it. But what this focus is tonight is all about the comings of Messiah. What the newer or new people have never heard before is that <laughs> it's going to blow you away. You're, you're going to see that Messiah, the church has told us that teaches on prophecy of them that teach on it, that Messiah doesn't come at all until he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Well, what you're about to understand here revealed in this ministry is it is way more than that. The Son of Man, he's not coming where where the whole world is going to see him from one end unto the other. No, that doesn't happen till he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. But he is coming in portions of time to different groups of people exactly as the Gospels have prophesied. And that's something that everybody hasn't yet understood, is that these differences within the Gospels are prophecy. We're told that what was shall be, what is shall be, here a little, there a little. We'll touch on that in a moment. You're going to see the, the, the mystery of the revelation of the end of days, and specifically today focusing on these periods of time when the Son of Man is coming. Now, like I said, some are brief into a specific group. One is going to be to a group when he's taken out, Another one to a group when he's taken out, but the but he's something is going to be seen coming. And then he's going to be here for a bit. And then he's going to be cut off. And then he's going to return when the whole world will see him as the all-powerful everything in heaven and earth now his. And it's going to shock you if you're new to this ministry or newer to the ministry. So where I recommend everybody begin, here is the playlist. Usually when I when I begin videos. Uh, I start right here, but I didn't realize one of my shorts ended up in the videos because it was a minute long, but when I put it into YouTube, it always adds a second for some reason. And so because it was a minute and one second, it wouldn't go in as a short and it came up as a video. But you could see why I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it the main picture. <laughs> I, I said it before, I can't wait till the shorts can choose their thumbnails. I've tried and looked at all sorts of different techniques and uh, I, I haven't figured any of them out yet, but it is coming. You know, I think the algorithm is doing this to me on purpose. <laughs> I've got, uh, I, I still have a number of them. I did some yesterday. I did two, two more yesterday that are slated. So there's one coming every day and they're slated for the next few days. I think I've got shorts all set up until uh, even Monday. Um, but then today, I also did a, uh, I'll get back to this playlist in a moment. Um, and then today I just did another video. So I'm doing another one called shareables. Um, I, I want them to be like this one in that 15 minute range. <laughs> Unfortunately, the one I did this afternoon, um, I, I, I wasn't able to do. It was like 42 minutes or 43 or something like that minutes. So it, it's still short. It's still long enough, but not too long, but long enough to give the details I wanted to give because when people are seeing the shorts that are being put out, they're, they're having trouble in saying, you know, oh, this guy is, he's seeing 14 years from one piece of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and is trying to make a whole doctrine of it. I wanted to show people that it's absolutely false that the 14 years is 100% true and shown throughout scripture, but I didn't want to go too deep down the rabbit trail. And so I brought it from, from the is of the New Testament and the was in the simplest place in the story of the Ark of the Old Testament. And so some of those things that are in that, 
not all of it, but just a little bit of the beginning parts I'm going to be sharing here tonight because they're part of these times, especially the times of his coming in 2024 and the events taking place before he returns um, at the Feast of Trumpets. You're going to see at the Feast of Trumpets of 2020, uh, sorry, of 2030. And then when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the Feast of Trumpets 2030. Why? Because if you've been watching for at least a little while, you know that pre, mid, and post are all true. Not maybe, not kind of, 100%, they are all true. And that's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. One goes above 14 years who are in Christ, and they go like a rapture to the third heaven. Then there's another that is the was caught up. It is the rapture of the great multitude of Revelation 7, and they're going to paradise. And then later in the chapter, he says, now I am coming to you the third time. So there's a taking, a taking, and a returning. And when you understand it, I promise you, scripture is going to open up like crazy. And where it all begins, is in this study note series right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. It's, you, you can watch them all, of course. I think there's 12 videos in that one, but really just the first four. The first four, the first one is this one right here that you see the thumbnail of, and it introduces the next three. It gives you a little bit of setup and understanding what's gonna come in the next three. And the first one after the intro, is a 30 minute Bible study that reveals that the differences in the gospels, in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke reveal that the end of days, it's Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that the first will be last and the last will be first. And when you see the, the, the prophetic revelations that are in there, you'll see that these differences within the gospels are not mistakes. They're, they're not just trying to get little insights. There is a prophetic is to come understanding in them, and it changes everything once you see it. It is prophecy written all throughout the Gospels. It really is that exciting. That's where you need to start to understand. The, the third video, which is the second one after the intro, is the 14 years. And that 14 year video, the only way you start to begin to understand it is by first, as I said, starting with understanding who the Gospels are speaking to. But once you do, when you get into that 14-year video, you'll understand exactly what Paul is talking about when he talks about above 14 years and then the period of the 14 years. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And, and the video that I did this afternoon, uh, like I said, that's 40-something minutes, part of my quote-unquote uh, shareables that are supposed to be more like 15 minutes. Um, but it, it's, you know, again, 45 minutes, I th still think that's reasonable for such an incredible uh, uh, revelation, such an incredible piece of understanding to see that what Paul was saying is in fact true. And so that's going to come out uh, later next week or, you know, early mid next week. Uh, you're going to see that one play out and it'll be, it'll, because of its length, it'll just be under videos. So check that one out if you're still trying to grow in that understanding, because as much as this is just going to touch on parts of it, it's really just touching on the beginning parts when Messiah is coming and, and the, the time frame of what he does while he's here compared to the rest of what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is when he comes uh, in 2030 and when he comes again in 2037. So hold on tight, get ready. It's the whole meal deal. And then what you see is after the understanding and you begin to understand the 14 years you're going to say my goodness how did we not see this before how was this never understood and the number one reason is because it wasn't the timing the lord had it planned for a certain time and it's coming through this ministry others are learning it and they're sharing it in different parts of the world and i, I can't explain it except i can prove it through scripture and I can show it from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. So I promise you, it's worth your time to check out those intros. You're gonna see that the reason it was missed outside of timing was because everybody has learned from the foundation of the Gospel of Matthew. And they've only looked to the Synoptic Gospels of Mark and Luke as little add-on insights 
to give a bigger or a clearer picture of what happened in Matthew. Well, that's not why Mark and Luke were written for us. There is so much more, and in the is to come, it's all prophecy. All right, so you can find those here, and then you can go on from there and, and watch other things. But I also want you to see this here. You can also come to our website, Ministry Revealed, the intro. So if you go to the menu, you click on intro, and it'll take you here, and it's the same four videos. That's your intro, 22 minutes. There's your revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, to reveal to you pre, mid, and post. There's the 14 years that it reveals that tribulation isn't seven, and that the reason everybody thought it was seven and got confused in mashing seals and trumpets together is because it's all because of Matthew. Because everybody's foundation is in the Gospel of Matthew. Once you understand these foundational videos, then you can go deep. Then you can go into these things. Like this one is a three-hour study of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. And then you can go deeper. You can see that the discourses of Luke, Mark, and Matthew are all pre, mid, and post. The above 14, then the seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. I'm telling you, when you understand it, it is going to blow your mind. See, pre, mid, and post, they're all true. There's typologies of them in the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrection, all from Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So these four, though, right here are where you need to start. All right? And whenever you're looking for something, this is just one of the last videos, but whenever you're looking for something, one, you can either go to the website, or two, you can click in the description box under any video, under any of the shorts, and you can find these links. So you can find links to the website to get to the intro page. You can find links to the intro of the playlist on YouTube. Uh, if you wanted to support the ministry here or support the ministry we have in Uganda, you can get our Ministry Revealed book on Amazon <coughs> if you like to have uh, that book feel. But you can also download it for free on ministryrevealed.com so you don't have to pay for it. I think we've got it downloadable in five languages for free um, on the website. You can even listen to it on the website for free and begin to understand deeper into these revelations as you're learning them along the way. We have different charts here that you'll see along the way as I go through videos. So you can always find those in the description box under the videos as well, just to help you guys out with that. So let's get going with this. When we when we get into this, a lot of people say, oh, this is craziness. You know, you're just taking one thing here and you're taking one thing there. No, no, no. We are taking concepts of, of typologies of events that have happened because we're told in Scripture to do so. This is the revelation of the end of days. And we understand it right here in Isaiah 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So you're going to get some here. You're going to get some there. And there's going to be a context within these events of history that have taken place that play into this is to come. And when I say history, it's like Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us. The thing that has been means from creation to Christ, right? Just to the birth of Christ. The thing that has been is that which shall be, which means the future is to come, the end of days. And that which is done, which means from the birth of Christ until the pre-trib escape, is that which shall be done. So the Old Testament from creation to Christ shall be, and the is from Christ to the moment of the pre-trib escape is the is that is a picture of the shall be as well which means Old Testament, New Testament, have here a little, there a little. Understanding them in context, precept upon precept, to reveal the picture of the end of days. And that's what we've been doing here for six years. Oh, six years today. I just realized it's September 8th. It's September 8th, brothers and sisters. This is a, a very, very special day for Ministry Revealed. I started. The, the channel name in February, I think, of 2017. 
I didn't do my first video until the 16th and 17th of June in two parts about the Mark of the Beast, an incredible two-part 30-minute videos each. And it wasn't until September 8th of 2017 that everything changed. I, I saw something in Revelation 12 at the beginning while I was in Revelation 12 connecting to Luke 21, just thinking it was the same type of discourse as the rest because I knew nothing at that point. And I remembered hearing about Isaiah 66, 7 that said before she travailed, she brought forth. And I said, what? And so in the midst of that video, it's one of the first videos, one, not the first, but one of the very first ones, like around, around, I don't know, eight or 10 videos or something like that in when you go into our YouTube channel, look for a video from September 8th. And in the midst of that video, it dawned on me and I realized I was seeing something. And I said to people that were listening, okay, there, you know, something along the lines of there's something here that I'm just realizing, but if anything comes from it, I'll, I'll leave it for now. But if anything comes from it, I'll let you guys know. That was the moment. That was the literal moment that my entire life changed. That within six months, I had shut down my business, the product that I invented. Can you believe the product I invented was called Amaze Away, Permanently Gone? That blows people away. I know when, um, when I first realized it, I, I freaked out by it. It was called Amaze Away, like pre-trib, permanently gone. Absolutely incredible. And it was a permanent marker remover. You can remove permanent marker from plastic, glass, from, from, from tiles, from all sorts of things. And uh, that was my product. I was in uh, 298 stores in Western Canada. We were on Amazon. I had just done a deal uh, right around this time when this happened in, in September of, um, of uh, 2017. I had done a deal with uh, Maynards. I know I'm a little sidetracked, but it's, it's a special day. And uh, Maynards in the U.S. for 308 stores at the time to, for them to uh, put them in all of their stores. And I ended up canceling the order. Can you believe it? Uh, it came to about early next year in 2018. I ended up canceling the order. And in around, uh, around February or something like that, when I canceled the order, this became my full time. I knew that I knew that I knew. Uh, I had so many freakouts in those first six months, let alone the first year and a bit, just being in tears because from somebody who was barely reading parts of scripture here and there and didn't like the these and nows and everything else, and it was just confusing, I would read and I understood. And I, I, I couldn't understand what was happening to me. Even it, it, it wells me up with tears thinking about it because I was, I was in such a panic and such a freakout because... Uh, these things were things that had never been understood before. And I knew where their connections were by just reading another piece of scripture. I instantly knew where the connection was from the old into the new. And it was just like, I, I was freaking out. And so I knew this was what I had to do and start sharing and getting it out there and, and put all the time and devotion into this. And uh, because this was my calling, this was what I was anointed to do. And uh, my goodness, what a six year journey or five and a half since full time. Um, what, <laughs> what a ride it's been, man. But yeah, so that was a little side note. I just realized it was September 8th, even though I wrote it down earlier, I said it earlier, it just clued in now. So that's a little bit of the behind the scenes story for anybody that's new. And, you know, uh, Isaiah 28 and Ecclesiastes 1 9, man, that's, that's the epitome of what has happened here in this ministry. So, yeah, so what we're going to do, as I said, is going to focus on these portions of time when the Son of Man is coming, when Messiah will be here, not, not boasting around saying, I'm Messiah, I'm Messiah, but when he's coming to do specific things at certain times, and you're going to see it for yourselves. I don't know if you realize, well, yeah, you guys can see it. All of these tabs here I have opened from here all the way to the end, and I couldn't even open anymore because I've got 70 tabs open. These are all for tonight. There's like 60 plus tabs open for tonight because, and I, that doesn't even cover it all. We're going through dozens and dozens of scripture and it doesn't even cover it all. So like I said, this is gonna be the full meal deal 
And as always, man, I hit my knees before every video and pray that the Lord will lead us in his will, that the Lord will open the ears and the eyes, will open the hearts, circumcise the hearts for those who are coming to hear, that they would receive it, that they would be diligently seeking in this, because I understand it's a lot to take at first. But if you, if you bite-size it along the way, and you go in and you seek it and you pray over it, I promise you the Spirit will reveal it to you. And it is such a joy. It is so incredible. It, everybody that it has touched has gotten closer and closer and more diligent in the Word, in the Lord, than they were before. Because their understanding opens up. You begin to read and you begin to understand what it's saying. You know where it fits. That's how crazy good it is. All right? So now, let's get started. Let's start right here in Luke chapter 12. So what you have to understand, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, the comings of the Lord. He is coming right at the time of the beginning, at the escape of the bride of Christ. But right before, in that above 14 years that Paul talks about, is a time of 50 days. And you'll see that in next week's... Um, uh, a shareables video that I did this afternoon. It goes into that detail. But what you're going to see is that the Son of Man is going to meet, or the Spirit of the Lord is going to meet with his remnant worker, first fruits bride, who are the ones who will put their necks on the line serving him during the time of tribulation. He is going to meet with them briefly. Then, the same day, hours, minutes later, I don't know. But certainly that same day, he's going to vanish and he, he's going to take the pre-trib bride of Christ. I'm going to back this by scripture. When he takes the bride of Christ, that remnant portion will remain as we're going to read here in Luke 12. And they're going to be remaining and they're going to be prepared for when he returns after the wedding. It's a seven-day wedding, that Gentile bride wedding that takes place. When that Gentile bride wedding is done on the seventh day, so after seven days, meaning he's coming back on the eighth day, he's coming to begin his 40 days as he prophesied he would do as being a warning like Jonah was. When those 40 days are over, he leaves. And there's that not many days like Acts 1 for which this remnant group will be waiting for the 50th day anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they will go out from Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem will be destroyed. Now the Son of Man is gone. He's out of the picture. It's the time of seals. Until the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming at the Feast of Trumpets, and that's the 2030 when he is seen at the Feast of Trumpets, or when he is coming in the clouds. And we're going to break this down. He then remains for a few years. You're saying, what? Yep. He's going to be here for about four and a half years. Approximately four and a half years. Not walking around, not everybody seeing him and everything else. You'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And then he's cut off. And there's a period of time and events that happen during this cutoff. And then he will return feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the sixth year of trumpets for a total of 13 years of tribulation. And when he does, that is when he's going to be seen as lightning from one end unto the other in his day, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, which is the final 14th year of tribulation. It's all laid out in scripture. It's that incredible. All of this is backed and supported by Scripture. So let me start with you right here in Luke chapter 12. And as you have that prophetic eyes, if, if you've been watching some of the shorts and you started to watch some of the intro videos, keep that prophetic understanding when you're reading these things, when you're seeing them and when you're praying and when you're digging into them yourself. Listen to what he says here in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35. He's talking to his little flock from verse 32. And it says, Let your loins be girded about 
and your lights burning, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, and that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Now, this was a uh, like a parable, right? He's, did, did the Lord leave to go to a wedding? Did he come and knock? Was it, a, was it a period of time when he went to this wedding and he sat down to eat with them? This is prophecy. This is prophecy. He's talking to a group of people called his little flock, which is that remnant first fruits workers of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, <laughs> just like we read in Exodus 34, 22, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. That is that group. They're the part of the, the two wave loaves and so forth, all right? So what he's telling them is this is a group that has been reserved, that has been, that has been chosen from before the foundation of the earth. Yes, the pre-trib is as well. But he is speaking here to a group that will remain to serve him. Let me prove it. Listen to what he says after this. So as your Lord, when he will return from the wedding to be girded about, that when he comes and knocks, you open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, he, uh, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down, and he will come forth and serve them. How do you know there's a part, a second and a third? Well, he tells us. Remember, pre, mid, post? So he's got the pre-taken, and he's got a group that remains. Then at the great multitude rapture, he's got a group, the 144, that will then work during trumpets. And at the end of trumpets, he's then got a group from the 12 tribes that go out during the millennial reign. We've got videos on it, and it's all revealed in the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So the second watch relates to the 144,000, and the third watch relates to the 12 tribes that go out during the millennial reign. This first one, though, is what we're talking about in relation to Christ at the very beginning. So... You could see he hasn't even left to the wedding yet. This is because I believe what this is telling us is he is pre-warning, he is pre-informing that remnant bride worker ahead of time, right, probably right at that time, at the start of the above of the 50 days, right before the pre-trib escape happens. And the reason is because they are expectant. They're expectant to, to be part of the pre-trib bride. You see, they're watching, they're praying, they're diligently seeking him, they love, they're repentant. You see, so could you imagine not being told and you're chosen to be a remnant worker and the pre-trib happens, tens of millions of people vanished and the world starts to go in chaos. Wouldn't you be freaked out if you were still left behind? <laughs> right? Well, this here is telling us, this is prophetic insight, that he's going to inform them right before it happens. All right? And who are these people? Well, here's another typology. Listen to what he says here. In John chapter 20, John chapter 20 is also the picture of the beginning of the 50 days to when he returns on the eighth day. And listen to how it starts. Here's a picture in the is, of course, it's a story of his resurrection. You go to Luke in 24, of course, it's a story of his resurrection. But it's the prophetic insight that is laid in within it that we're looking at. And so what do we see in this? We see this picture of the Son of Man now here. He says, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and told. So what happens? Here he is, he's come right before the pre-trib escape, and in this case, he's telling Mary Magdalene to go tell them, okay? So Mary Magdalene is almost like the same picture of that remnant bride worker. He's there, but he's only here for a moment. And do you realize that's exactly what happens here in, in John chapter 20? He's here, he says this to her, and then what does he do? He vanishes. He's gone. How do we know? Because then it says, then the same day, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, the
The doors were shut and now he's meeting with the apostles. If, if you've been following the ministry, you know that what happens is he meets. So what we've seen is he briefly, right before the escape, he informs the remnant workers who are not the apostles. They are the disciples. Okay, there's a difference. And what happens is he informs them like we just showed in Luke chapter 12. He takes the pre-trib group then. This group remains girded about waiting for his return when he will come and serve them and have a meal with them. So they're girded about. They're waiting for when he returns from the wedding, which means after seven days on the eighth day. He's now taken. So he's informed them. He's taken the pre-trib group and he comes back on the same day at evening from when he has taken the pre-trib group. So the same beginning of the 50 days, the same pre-trib escape day. And what does he do? He meets with whoever the modern day apostles are going to be. We've shown this, it's all revealed, even in the book we talk about it. You're gonna see it in the, uh, in the Ministry Revealed book. Oh, where am I? I think it's chapter 126. You're going to see the chart right here of the seven churches and how they lay out the end of days prophecy. This is the apostles time and the beginning of the 50 days. Well, what? While he's having the day of his espousals. You see the week of his espousals. So what ends up happening is he breathes on the apostles, the Holy Ghost. So they're receiving the Holy Ghost right there, right at the beginning of the 50 days. The escape has happened. He comes back at evening and he breathes on the apostles, the Holy Ghost. Now what happens? Now he leaves. Just like it says, he's gone and doubting Thomas wasn't there. And what happens? The Lord is now gone. He's gone to the seven day wedding. That's the prophetic picture in the end of days. He's gone to the seven day wedding. So when does he return? He's returning on the eighth day. It just so happens, that's what, he, that's what happens with Thomas, right? Where is it? Uh, oh, there it is. In John 20, verse 26. And after eight days again, there he is. He comes again on the eighth day. So what is this a picture of? It's the picture of him coming after seven days from the wedding. Now he's returning. And he's about to begin his 40 days, or he's beginning his 40 days as the Son of Man. I'm going to go into that. First thing he's going to do is he's going to meet briefly with the apostles to see whatever, you know, see what they did with what they were given during that week. In fact, we've connected this to what you see happen, like the, the coins and the money that was given. And you see it in Matthew chapter uh, 26 as well. At the, while the, while the one week wedding at the end of the 14 years of tribulation, in that final one week wedding that takes place for the Judah wedding, for the Jews, that wedding, you see that same, the coins that were given, it, it's what they were doing during those seven days. And that's the typology of what's going on here with the apostles. He's gonna meet with them again and see what took place during those seven days. What did they do? What have they done? And then what does he do? Then he's going to go meet with, those that he said from Luke 12, that when he goes, he's going to return after the wedding. And when he does, they had better be girded about. Okay, we're gonna cover that in a second. But how about this, what about this connection to the bride of Christ? Okay, the bride of Christ, for those that have been studying, know that the bride of Christ who, who escapes, so he meets with the group, bang, then he takes out the pre-trib bride of Christ. When he takes them out, everybody knows, well, anybody that studies scripture, for the most part, understands prophetically that Enoch is a picture of the Gentile bride. And what do we see with Enoch? Enoch lived 365 years. He walked with God and he was not, for God took him. What do we know about Enoch? We know in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased 
God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, look what happens next. Then you've got the 40 days relation to Noah, and what does it say? Being warned of God. I share that in, in the video I did this afternoon as well. There's your pre-trib escape picture. And then you have the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man in the time of the days of Noah. And it's while the Son of Man, God, is warning them. It's a perfect picture. Okay, So Enoch is that picture of the pre-trib bride of Christ. We know that he was 365 years, and years can be as days. And days can be a picture of years in the prophetic, and I'm going to show that to you. But when is it believed that Enoch was taken? They believe that he was taken on the same day that he was born, which they believe is the 6th of Savan. We've been showing here that the 6th of Savan, first of all, it 100% is not Pentecost, but it's also not the Feast of Weeks. The true Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of the weed harvest of the Feast of Weeks, as we saw in Exodus. See, the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's not the 6th of Savan. This is where the, the church has, has, has twisted everything, as we said earlier, putting everything together like seals and trumpets. When you realize that it's separate, that there's a period of seals and a period of trumpets, seven years and seven years, when you realize this above portion and these connections, these other parts of Scripture and their feast days and so forth, where they belong, really opens up. So they believe it's the 6th of Savan, but not because it's the 6th of Savan, but because they believe the 6th of Savan is the Feast of Weeks. Why? Because to the Father God, the Feast of Weeks is the beginning. The Feast of Weeks is, is quote unquote, the beginning. It's like where everything starts. So he's got his count, which we won't get into, that relates to Taurus. But where the Feast of Weeks is, is something that is observed every year in the heavenlies. And Enoch was what? 365 years as a picture of 365 days. So where is all of this in 2024? In about early mid-August. This is the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks. And this begins the 50 days or the seven day wedding for which one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which means early in the morning on the eighth day is when the Son of Man is coming. That's if we finally understood and it's actually going to happen in 2024. And as we get towards the end of this, you'll understand why I believe it's connected in 2024 because of what Scripture tells us. There's some incredible things. like We've talked about it many times, but when you see the revelation of the two swords in Luke and you understand what they apply to in the end of days, you'll understand why 2024, I believe, is the final opportunity. I could be wrong. This is the revelation of the word, not a thus saith the Lord. I don't receive uh, uh, dreams, visions, and, and audibles from the Lord. I receive revelation through diligently seeking, and I'm able to understand where these things connect. But it's that starting year that has always been the mystery. Nobody's been given, here it is. It is through the process of revealing scripture that we draw closer and closer and more opens up as we diligently seek. But you'll understand why in the end, 2024. So what are we seeing happening? As I said, he meets with that first group. He then goes to the wedding. Uh, uh, sorry, he meets with that one group. The pre-trib escape happens. He, he comes back on this same day at evening. When he comes back the same day at evening, he anoints the apostles. Then he's gone to the wedding for seven days. And when he returns after seven, on the eighth day, that's where we are in John chapter 20. You're going to see this connection to the eighth day in other places as well. And so where does it all start? At true Feast of Weeks, the eighth of Av. 
The eighth of Av is the seventh Sabbath of the true counting of the Feast of Weeks. Now, it seems very convoluted. It seems very twisted on how you can get to that date. The answer is found in Deuteronomy it's chapter 16 when you understand that the count for it is from the wheat harvest. Now, is it possible that the, that the pre-trib bride is the end of the barley harvest and that the first fruits of the wheat harvest are the workers for the great multitude harvest of wheat? Yes, it's possible. But it will still all be connected to beginning here. Am I convinced that we are the, that, that the pre-trib going is, is the main harvest of the barley? I am not committed. I'm not for certain that it is because everything else is talking about wheat. However, when we understand that the wheat is talking about the first fruits, it may be because those first fruits are the workers who are going to be the winter wheat workers that will help bring in the spring wheat of the great multitude wheat harvest. All right? So in, in, in that, in a way, it's still splitting hairs because it's not so much of, is it this portion of the harvest or that portion per se? It's the timing. It's understanding that there are 50 days after the Feast of Weeks, and those 50 days are the 50 days that are the above 14 years. And the Son of Man is going to meet with that group to warn them he's coming back from the wedding. Then he's going to take out the bride. Then he's going to return the same day at evening. He's going to anoint the apostles and he's going to leave for the wedding and then return on the eighth day. And from this eighth day when he returns, he's then going to remain for 40 days. All right. You're going to see this in typology. So the reason I wanted to bring up Enoch is because we know Enoch is the typology of that pre-trip being taken out, not tasting of death. They're not going to experience death. Whoever is in Christ alive at the pre-trib escape, that's it. Those are the ones in Christ that Paul said above 14 years. They're going to the third heaven. And their connection is to the true feast of weeks. Now, you saw that in, um, in, uh, da, 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 in, for Enoch in Genesis 5, that this connection was 365 years, right? So 365 years, well, in prophetic insight to the end of days, you can take scripture and scripture can be translated from years to days and sometimes days to years. So when we just saw 365 years, we know they're also a picture of 365 days. The mystery over the, over the years of us seeking this has been always to try to understand what are these 365 days that are connected to Enoch. Well, they're the Feast of Weeks. There's no way around it. It is the Feast of Weeks. It's been passed down and it's been in books written for centuries and centuries and centuries, even longer than that. So this is why I'm saying we've understood now. I don't believe we're looking to anything this year. We're not looking to things here in 2023. Does it mean that it's not possible? Does it mean we stop watching? Absolutely not. We need to keep watching. We don't know for sure if it's 2024. I believe I could show that it's actually 2024. However, I'm not expectant, even though I'm always diligent in seeking and watching. And I want everybody to know, you know, our brother Chris gave me this, this great, uh, uh, he had sent me a message and it was, it was a great little piece of insight to say, I think we need to prepare people's hearts. And what I mean by that is that I'm, I don't believe that what everybody is excited and looking for in September here, mid-late September into the first half of October, I don't believe it's going to happen. Now, again, yes, I can be wrong. I am not saying this to, to crush your dreams or to, or to put damper on your hope. This is all about hope. This is all about hope and understanding we are that final generation. But I want you guys to know, we're not going anywhere. I mean, what I mean, I don't mean it in that sense. I mean, this ministry, we're here. We're with you. 
if nothing happens and and we're still all here and mid-October comes and goes, Ministry Revealed is here. You have your brothers and sisters, your family in Christ here. Don't be so distraught. Don't be so beating up or anything on yourself. But come back. Spend more time. Come to the forum at Ministry Revealed. So like I said, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. You can click in here. Go to the forum. If you're new, it'll take you a few seconds to sign up. It's free. And join 1,100, 1,200 people from all over the world sharing, uplifting, even a bunch of them watching for this September into October. And that's why I'm talking about this, because we have some very dear brothers and sisters in Christ here in this ministry that I, I just want to let them know that we're here. As you guys were here when we got beat up several years ago, we're here. And we will continue to diligently seek and share together. We will figure this out together. We will continue to search them out. We will continue to lift each other up in love. We will continue to do everything that we can to spend time in them, to share news, events. In fact, I think today, here's a great event. Oh, Mike, I just realized, I think I got Mike from 165's birthdays today, September 8th. I think our brother Mike, oh, I don't want to, well, I could say his age. It's either 37 or 38. But our mother, brother Mike from 165, I think it's his birthday today. How fitting, September 8th. I almost forgot about that one. Happy birthday, brother. But we'll be here. We'll lift each other up. We will renew each other's strength. And we will keep the watch going. Don't let it disappoint you and weigh you down so much that you just say, forget it and stop watching. We're here, and we'll bring it in together right to the end. All right? We love you, and we'll always be here for as long as it takes. So with that, let's continue this. So we've understood this with Enoch, and here's this thing we were talking about when it comes to the wheat harvest, and specifically the winter wheat, which is the old that goes first. It says, um, it is ready for harvest at the end of July to beginning of August. So again, it depends on what year we're in, right? So in 2023, it was late July. In 2024, it's early mid-August. Hello. This is when the winter wheat is ready. It's directly connected to true feast of weeks. This is why I say I'm not convinced that it's necessarily barley in the main harvest of barley. Okay? Because late July to early-ish August is the time when the winter wheat is harvested and it's all done. That's when the two loaves of bread are made from this wheat. You have to understand that those two wave loaves with leaven can't be made from spring wheat that is brought in in the fall. It can't be used until Passover the following year. Well, there are no two wave loaves brought in at Passover. Hello. It's connected to true Feast of Weeks. And now that we understand these first comings of Christ, you know, to, to one group. And like I said, when he meets with that first group before the wedding, he's, I, I don't know if it's in spirit. I don't know if the angels are coming I, and there's a visitation. I don't know how it's going to work. If he's coming in a dream or visions to his remnant workers to let them know in advance, I don't know how it's going to happen. But that is a type of one of his comings right before it all starts, even though it's to a specific group. Then, bang, the escape happens, and the world will be caught off guard, just like Luke 21, 35 says, okay? Was it 34, 35, and through 36, right? Those who are watching and praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, I believe is right in here. And as I said, he's gone to his wedding, so he'd return on the 16th of Av, or August 20th of 2024 is when he comes to begin his 40 days as the Son of Man. Okay, again, here's that wheat. Okay, winter wheat compared to spring wheat. We've shared on that before. So now that we saw in John chapter 20, we saw that whole beginning 
part that I've gone through in, in various portions and ways there, that then he comes on the eighth day. He meets with those, those uh, apostles. Now Thomas is there and he meets with them. And on that same eighth day, what you have now is this picture of when he meets with the two on the road to Emmaus. These two on the road to Emmaus are a picture of that first fruits remnant worker bride that we call them. These are the ones that he spoke to before, right before the pre-trib happened in Luke chapter 12. Now he's come back, it's the eighth day, and what is he going to do? Knock and it be open to them. And, and, and what did he say that he would do only to that group? He said that he would come, sit with them, and serve them a meal. Well, guess what happens? In Luke chapter 24, when he comes at the eighth day after the wedding, look at what he does. Where is it? In Luke chapter 24, verse 30, P.S., this is only found in Luke's. In Mark's, he, the, the typology in Mark's is that he berates them. He, he rails on them because they weren't prepared believing that he was coming. That's a picture of the 144 at the end of six years of seals. What do you see at the end of the sixth seal? You open up chapter seven and the 144,000 are about to be sealed. Then you go to Matthew and the, the story is, is nothing like either of them because it relates to those at the end of the 13th year of seals. I mean, uh, of tribulation, which is the end of the sixth year of trumpets when he comes on Mount Zion. That's why it's, I mean, when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when you read that in Matthew, you could see this group that's then going to go out and he's with them until the end of the world. It's fascinating. So look at what he does here in Luke 24, verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. He only does this with the remnant worker Luke portion. Just like he said he would with those who were in the first watch. That when he returns from the wedding to be ready when he, open, when he knocks on the door. He only does it to this group. And then look what it says. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished. Okay, so he vanishes, but he ends up coming back, right? I don't know what that vanishing, where he was, what he does, okay? So their understanding is now open, and they realize it's him. Well, you have to understand, this is after the wedding. So in this case, these guys were prepared when he returns, and what is he going to do? He's going to sit down and have a meal with them, and he's going to serve them. And then what does he do? He lets them know that the things that were written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms concerning him were yet to be fulfilled. This is what we're preparing people for here in this ministry. Now, I don't believe everybody, but I believe there's a group of us here in the ministry that are going to go pre-trib, that are watching, praying, and diligent. And there's a, a reward in receiving revelation and being able to understand it, that the Spirit is working in them. But I believe there's another portion within the ministry who we're going to remain and be this portion of this group. I'm not saying only in this ministry, they might be parts of other people around the world too, but certainly in this ministry, this is the preparing that's happening for this group right here. And what does he do? Then he opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So we're preparing this in revelation of what we're receiving and sharing. And when he comes, he's going to complete the understanding by opening it all up. And what does he tell them? That they're going to then go out, preach remission of sin and repentance, uh, uh, repentance and remission of sins, that it should be preached among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Only Luke says that they would do this beginning at Jerusalem. So what do we see happening here? This is a picture of while the Son of Man is here during 40 days. He then says that they're going to be, uh, they're going to tarry in Jerusalem and they're going to be endued with power from on high. That's when the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes not many days from then. All right? So this is a picture of him coming from the eighth day and him here during the 40 days. What else can we understand about this group? This is them here. Remember, Ephesus is a picture of 
the beginning of the 50 and the apostles receiving the anointing of the Holy Ghost when he breathes on them. And Smyrna is the group that is connected. We shared on this many times. That's connected to the Luke 24. That's connected to the Luke 12 when he returns from the wedding. It's, it's the Smyrna group that begins on the eighth day when he comes to start his 40 days. Listen to what it says. Okay, uh, da, 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 verse 10 for Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He that heareth, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. This is a conversation that only happens to the Smyrna group. Okay, so it's a group prepared, warned in advance, prepared when he comes after. He opens their understanding. He has a meal with them after the wedding. And some of them are going to be persecuted and killed, but they're going to be part of a group of people that won't be hurt by the second death. Well, that only represents one group of people, and it's the remnant first fruits workers of the wheat harvest. Here they are right here in Revelation chapter 20. So this is at the end of the tribulation, and we see that there's a group of people that were beheaded. They were beheaded for the witness. Remember, he calls them witnesses. He says, you are my witnesses. In Luke chapter 24, he tells that remnant worker group, those disciples, that Smyrna type, that they are his witnesses. And they're gonna be beheaded for the witness of Christ and for the word of God, they worship not the beast, nor his image, nor he received his mark in their hand and forehead. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It says, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are, were finished. This is the first resurrection. So this group is going to have part in the first resurrection, and they're going to be with Christ for a thousand years. Listen to what it says about them. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, here it is. The second death has no power, but they shall rule, uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Who are the ones that will have uh, uh, on such second death will have no power? You got it. In Smyrna. In Smyrna shall not be hurt by the second death. Those who put their necks on the line. So these are those same remnant workers that are going to be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for the thousand years. And, and what do we see about these people? Again, it starts from those eight days as we shared earlier, when he starts the 40 days as the son of man. We know it's when he returns from the wedding. And if you guys have been following this, this is really awesome. I know we've shared on it a number of times, but a lot of this is maybe to, to help with understanding for newer people. Listen to what it says in Luke chapter 14. We have this wedding feast. This wedding feast is spoken of in Luke. There's none spoken of in Mark. And then there's one spoken of in Matthew, but it's different. Then we have, after the wedding feast, we have a parable of a great banquet. There's no banquet parable in Mark, and there is no parable in Matthew. Well, isn't that funny? Because Luke chapter 12 just told us when he returns from the wedding, only one group, which is the first group of the remnant workers, is he going to sit down and eat with? So this is the picture of the pre-trib bride being taken, pre-trib to the wedding. I tell everybody, and we've been talking about it for years, when you go pre-trib to the third heaven, sit in the lowest room of the third heaven. Don't go sit in the highest room. And then when he comes back from the wedding, for whoever of us are remnant worker brides, this is that meal that he said he would have with that first group. How do we know? We've talked about it before, but it says in verse uh, Luke 14, 14, and thou shall be blessed for they cannot recompense thee for thou shall be recompensed. Listen to this at the resurrection of the just. Who are those part of the resurrection of the just? We just showed you they're the Smyrna group. 
They're the Smyrna group. They're the ones he's going to have a meal with when he returns from the wedding. And only in Luke is there a banquet after the wedding. Pretty fascinating, right? That it, it just blows my mind to be able to comprehend and to see the flow of these things, to be able to lay out these things that are taking place during the 50 days. And there are many more things. We have a video if you want to watch and learn and understand more of what takes place in those 50 days. There's a video called The 50 Days. I think it's got a, a yellow thumbnail with 50 on it. Go and watch that and you'll get even greater detail. So because we're, we're talking about what's taking place during this period of time when the Son of Man comes. So how can we prove that the Son of Man, outside of those things we've already shown, how can we show that the Son of Man is actually coming for 40 days? Well, he told us in Luke chapter 11, when he says, um, starting in 29, halfway through, they seek a sign and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. What's he saying? He's saying he is going to be a sign of warning for 40 days as Jonah was. But the world of church has told us that Jesus fulfilled this at his resurrection. He didn't. He did not go around warning during the 40 days. That's not what he did. He says he's going to do this. This is in the prophetic. This is why when you go into Mark's story of Jonah, he says, no sign shall be given to you. And he leaves on the, on the ship. And people, they get all up in arms to show that these are discrepancies written by men within scripture. It's not. It's prophecy. And the reason he says no sign is given in Mark is because at the end of seals, when the rapture time is coming, they have no sign that's going to be given to them. They're just going to suddenly see him coming in the clouds and those who are ready for him going in the pre-trib in that seventh year of seals. No sign is going to be given to them. You see, what about the one in Matthew when it says after three days and three nights? So it's after three days and three nights, which means sometime on the fourth day. That hasn't been fulfilled because Christ was not in the grave for three days and three nights, meaning coming up on the fourth day. It was literally impossible when 15 places in Scripture said that he um, said that he resurrected on the third day. It's literally impossible. It's because it was prophecy. And the way to clearly understand it is when you understand these differences in the Gospels, there's no way you can get around realizing that what he says in Luke about Jonah, Mark and Matthew all about Jonah, the reason for those quote unquote discrepancies is because they were there for prophecy. They have not yet been fulfilled. And that's why it says to this generation, it means the final generation. So he's telling you in the prophetic, he's coming for 40 days to be a warning. Where else do we see it? We see him here in Luke chapter 17. And in Luke chapter 17, they're asking him about his coming. When is the kingdom of God going to come? When, when is all of this going to take place? They're talking and they're asking him about the coming of the, of the end. And he tells them this. In verse 24, he says, For as lightning that lighteth under one part of heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. This is, this is what you read in Luke chapter 24, I think verse 27, and, uh, sorry, in Matthew 24, verse 27, and what you read in Matthew 28. This is when he's seen coming from lightning from one end to the other, returning feet down on the Mount of Olives when the whole world will see him. But listen to what he says next. In verse 25, he says, but first, I love that one, but first. Do you know why he says, but first? Well, I'll show you when we get to it. You're, you're gonna wanna remember this if you're new. There's a reason why he says, but first. So this is gonna be when I come in my day, lightning, when the whole world is gonna see me, but first, but First, so before this day comes, he says, but first, 
must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Remember what we just said about this generation? When he's talking about generation, he's talking prophetically about the final generation. Could you imagine? He's going to be rejected of this generation. Nobody really understood what this meant before. Everything he's talking about, though, is prophetic. So he's saying, but first, meaning before I come feet down on the Mount of Olives, I'm going to be rejected of this final generation. And he says, and in this time when I'm being rejected, verse 26 goes on to say, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So this isn't the reference to Matthew 24. This is the reference to Luke 11 when he's coming as the Son of Man during the typology of the 40 days of the flood. Did you, did you see that in, in Hebrews 11? This is why I want you to remember it. There's the pre-trib, Enoch taken out. And then what? Noah being warned of God. And what are we seeing? This warning of God. This warning taking place. It's the 40 days of the Son of Man while he's warning that what? He's probably doing incredible uh, uh, things too. He's probably saving people. There's signs. You got to remember, there will be people that will follow him. But for the most part, the world is going to reject them because they have no idea the Son of Man is coming for 40 days after the pre-trib escape wedding in the portion called above from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at this. There's your 40 days, right? Well, we go to Genesis and we try to follow the story and here it is. And the flood was 40 days on the earth. We go to Genesis 8. The 40 days come to an end. Then the raven goes out. And I talk about this in the earlier, in the shorter video today that'll be out next week. The raven goes out and the word for raven means Arab. The descriptive name, the root word of raven from the darker complexion of skin means Arab. This is when the Arab Antichrist spirit goes out. And who does it go into? Not saying that he's necessarily the Antichrist, but the Antichrist spirit first going out. This is Assad. This is when Jerusalem will be compassed about, attacked and destroyed. That'll be the beginning of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Look what happens next. So this is a picture of the 40 days that he said his 40 days would be as Noah when they got in the ark. That's the picture of his 40 days. And what happens when the 40 days are over? The raven is sent out. And how many days were in the picture of the story from John's chapter, chapter 20, into Luke chapter um, 24, into Acts 1, into Acts 2 that, we're getting, get, that we'll get into? Well, when the 40 days are over in Acts chapter 1, the angels tell them to be ready not many days from now. So what's the picture that we get here in the prophetic? Not many days from now is what? Three days. So when the Son of Man leaves, when the 40 days are done, what happens? The raven antichrist spirit goes out, and what does he do? Syria begins to compass Jerusalem and Judah. And then the dove goes out on the 50th day. When the dove goes out on the 50th day, the anointing of the promise that they were told in Luke 24, they receive it at true Pentecost, which is new wine. When they receive that anointing, they will then go out from Jerusalem to all nations. And when they leave Jerusalem, that compassing about that was taking place that everybody was warned to flee when they see coming, they now go out from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is destroyed. Watch. In Luke 21, listen to what it says. It says, Then said he unto them, 
So these aren't red letter words. This is only black letter words found in Luke. Whereas Mark and Matthew, it's red letter. And listen to what he says. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. He's telling you about the things that Mark and Matthew's portions of people are going to go through. And listen to what he says next. But before. Remember what he said in Luke 17? But first. The root word of but first is the word but before. Let me show you. Let's go into Luke 17. Again, this picture of him being here for 40 days, at the start of his 40 days. There it is, your picture of him being the 40 days as Noah. And he's warning as Jonah. And we see that it means beginning, before, start. It comes from the Greek word 4413. Foremost, beginning, first of all, comes from 4253. And it goes to the root word before in front of prior to. So now when we go to Luke 21, look at what it says in Luke 21. Luke 21, we read in verse 12, but before all of these. What is this but before all of these? This, but before all of verse 10 and 11 begins, this is going to take place. Which means what? During the 40 days of the Son of Man. Look at the word, but before. The Greek word, 4253. What was the root word of but first? 4253. And listen to what it says. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up into synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And there it is. Some of you they shall cause to be put to death. Remember what we just read in, in um, uh, Church of Smyrna in Revelation 2? And some of you they shall cause to be put to death. It's the same group, part of the resurrection. So you can imagine how intensely crazy it's going to get even during, I mean, tens of millions of people have vanished. Who knows everything else, which we've talked about in other videos. Then the Son of Man returns for 40 days. Why is this group, why is this Smyrna group being so persecuted right off the bat? Because they've been anointed by the Lord. They know, the enemy knows the anointing that this group is given. The enemy knows the time is at hand. He's been waiting for the, the revelation of the pre-trib escape and the anointing of this group. The creature's been waiting for it. That portion of seals. Remember, they're going to be given their understanding. They're going to be given power and authority and ability that Christ is going to make known to them. And this is taking place. It's starting right off the bat during the 40 days. Could you imagine? This isn't like only during the time of seals. This is during the 40 days it begins. Why? Because this group knows who Christ is as they're following him for 40 days and they've been anointed by him with understanding and power and authority. It's pretty wild. Okay, but then look what happens. Remember we said he's warning as Jonah did? Here he is right here, Luke 21, 20. But when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, when you go to the Old Testament, you see Syria, Syria, Syria everywhere. It's when Syria is then compassing them about. But this is the warning that Syria is coming to compass them about. You see it in so many places. In uh, 2 Chronicles 24 is, is, when, is when Israel, when, the, when Judah is strong and powerful, 
with a bigger army than Syria. But the Lord is going to deliver Judah into Syria's hands because of their disobedience. In the end, Israel will have a smaller army and, and Syria will come again. But this time, they're going to be destroyed because that's when the Lord returns feet down. But that's another story. So this is Syria compassing them about. We also see it in Isaiah 9. So he's warning right here, like he said as Jonah would, He's doing it here in Luke 21's discourse during the 40 days of the Son of Man, like he said he would for 40 days in Luke 17. And he's doing exactly what he said he would do. He's warning them that they're about to be destroyed. They're going to be surrounded and destroyed. And he says in 21, And let them which are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then it's going to continue what? Until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's the end of seals. You'll, you'll see a great connection to that with the grafted in in uh, the video I did earlier today that'll be out next week. But this is the Son of Man warning during those 40 days. You see, he's not warning while they're being surrounded. He's warning that they're about to be surrounded. And if they don't want to believe him now, they would certainly start to believe him as they're being compassed about. It's the picture of even Ishmael with Gedaliah. It's the same picture of Ishmael and Gedaliah from, from Ezra to 2 Chronicles to Jeremiah. It's in many, many scriptures talking about this story. Ishmael is the picture of Syria, of the Arab that's coming, that will compass him about. This is what he's warning about. Is he going to be doing other things while, while he's warning about that? Yes, definitely. What kind of things? Well, I'll show you some other insight on it in a moment. But who is he then as the son of man? Who is, what is he doing when he's here and he's warning and he's compassed about? Who, who, what, what does he represent? What do we see in the end of days that, that proves this out, that he's really going to be here as the son of man? The answer is the white horse rider. Jesus, Messiah, is the son of man. And in 2024, he will be here as the son of man, white horse rider. We talked about this. We've got videos about this bow and a crown. This, it relates to the time of travail which is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 66, 7. Before she travailed is the pre-trib of Revelation 12, verse 2. Before the travailing, that's the pre-trib escape. Before her pain, Isaiah 66, 7 says, she was delivered of a man-child, which means before the word pain in Revelation 12, 2, which means during the time of travail, is the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man. That's exactly what Bo means is connected to travail. And then what? A crown was given unto him. If you go to Song of Solomon, chapter 3, the last verse, I think verse 11, you see that we know that Christ that we read about in, in uh, Luke 11, as Jonah was, we see that what? A greater than Solomon is here. If you go to Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11, you see the picture of Solomon at the time of his espousals, his wedding, and his mother put the crown on his head. And who's the one that is greater than Solomon? Son of man. The white horse rider here for 40 days. When a crown had been put on him. It is the son of man here for 40 days. And a lot of people say, well, if he's the one breaking the seal, how can he be here when he's breaking the other seals? It's because he opened one of the seals at a time. He didn't take the whole scroll and crack them all at once. It was the first one. And when the first one, he goes out as the son of man for 40 days. Remember what happens? He's warning about the compassing about and other things that he's going to do. And then at the end of 40 days, he's gone. When those 40 days, when he's gone at the end of 40 days, it's three more days before the attack happens. So it's not until he's gone 
and he's back in heaven. And what does he do? He opens the second seal. Hello. Of course he could be the white horse rider. He is the white horse rider. And I'm going to prove it to you more. Check this out. In Luke chapter 9, here's more. We're going to, we're going to just jump back. We're, we're getting towards now talking about the, the end of the 40 days. But we're still going to talk about this stuff with the 40 days. Because here's another piece. You're going to notice in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, it's always different. Or in they're always slightly different. But the Mark and Matthew wording is, is the same in this one part. But Luke's is different. Listen to what Luke 9.27 says. But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death. Huh. Sounds like Enoch, right? Till they see the kingdom of God. This is the pre-trib escape right here. And then what happens? What happens after the pre-trib escape? It's the wedding, right? It's the wedding, which means he's gone for seven days and he's not coming back till the eighth day. Oh my goodness, read the next verse. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. <laughs> I love this one. It was such a mystery to me for so long because in Mark and in Matthew, it says after six days and after six days, but they're not meant as days. They're, they're the picture we were talking about earlier where days can be years, okay? It's the day year principle or year day principle is a method of interpreting Bible prophecy in which the word day in prophecy is considered to be symbolic of a year of actual time. Okay, so these aren't things that are new. I'm not making this stuff up. We see it in scripture. 390 days as years for days and so forth, right? In Ezekiel. So what we see is I've understood that in Mark, after six days is after six years, which is after the six years of seals, when he comes at trumpets of 2030. After six days of Mark is after six years of, tri of trumpets tribulation, when he comes at the end of the 13th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it's at trumpets of 2037. But, Mar but Luke's had a double meaning to it because it is a picture of when he returns after the wedding on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. But it's also telling us about an eighth day because in the picture of years like the Luke and Mark, he's not coming after six for the pre-trib. It's when the, when the easy first seven years that we're in and the bride is being prepared to be taken, it's the seventh year coming to an end and it's just about the eighth year, which is what? The eighth year is the beginning of the next set of seven. Hello. So it's a picture of when he comes for 40 days on the eighth day, but it's also a picture of it almost being the end of the seventh year and the next set of seven, which is the eighth day with the start of the next eight, the next seven. And it's just before it. So it has a dual prophecy within it. But in what we're talking about here specifically is in relation to it being the eighth day after the wedding. And you had a group not tasting of death in the verse before it. And then him saying eight days after these sayings. I told you it's everywhere. It's in, it's in uh, what did we see, uh, 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 um, John going into Luke, into Acts, and so forth. We see it in the story of the ark, seven days, yet seven days, and after seven days, it's the same picture as this, as a type of years, but also days. And then we see it here. I'm telling you, there was, that's three witnesses right there in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, what is he going to do during these 40 days besides being a warning to Jerusalem and to the Jews that they're about to be compassed about and destroyed. Well, here's what's going to happen. When he comes, I love this. When I, when I discovered this existed, I, I couldn't believe it. I don't remember if somebody shared it with me. I don't remember what it was. But what had happened when I realized this, because... I didn't find this information on the Muslims Dajjal. 
I revealed that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days during the 50 day after the wedding. He's coming to start his 40 days. I didn't know that the Muslims had a character called the Dajjal. It wasn't until after. And the whole world, not only Muslims, believe that this Dajjal character is, their, is the Antichrist. In fact, there was that uh, TV series or uh, Netflix series called Messiah, where the Muslims were calling him the Dajjal. And, and Christians were siding, saying, no, it's the Antichrist. They're saying it's this, they're saying it's that. They were siding with each other that it was the Antichrist. But it wasn't. That show was actually a depiction of the Son of Man coming for 40 days. <laughs> Let that soak in for a moment. Do they know? Or were they just trying to confuse people with the Jal and Antichrist and, and Son of Man? And... Who is this Dajjal character? The Muslims call him the deceitful Messiah. They say when he comes, he's going to be doing signs and wonders and miracles. Listen to what it says in the etymology. Dajjal, from the root word Dajil, meaning lie or deception. It means deceiver and also appears in classic as Dagala, the compound of Al Al Messi, Al Dajjal with the definitive article, refers to the deceiving Messiah, a specific end-time deceiver. The Dajjal is an evil being who will seek to impersonate, listen to this, the true Messiah Jesus. This is from prophetic Muslim texts. Hello. Okay, in their hadith like their apocryphal books. If their apocryphal books of the Muslims are saying there's a guy coming at the beginning, at the time, at the end of days, who is the deceitful, lying antichrist, they even call him the Christian antichrist. Listen to this. Like in Christianity, the Dajjal is said to emerge out of the East, although variations uh, uh, differ. It says the Dajjal will imitate the miracles performed by Isa or Jesus, such as healing the sick, raising the dead. They think the latter one can only be done by devils. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, he will deceive many people, such as weavers, magicians, half-castes, and children of fornication. What do you, if the Muslims are saying this, who do you think this guy is? You would obviously have to say, this is probably actually the Son of Man. I've been proving it to you in Scripture that he's coming for 40 days during the beginning. And they have a guy that they say is coming at the beginning. But they're saying he's not actually Jesus, but he's the deceiver Jesus. Who do you think he actually is? He is the Son of Man. They think he's the Antichrist. But... But this doesn't say he's here for 40 days. Oh, really? Here's the Sunni eschatology of it. When the Dajjal appears, he will stay for 40 days. Ta-da. He will stay for 40 days doing signs, wonders, miracles. And according to scripture, he is the white horse rider doing as he said Jonah would, warning, uh, or as Jonah did, warning for 40 days, doing signs and wonders and miracles. And in Luke 17, he said he would be rejected. Why? Because the entirety of church has been told that the Son of Man, that the Messiah Lord, does not return until he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. Hello. Do you understand why now the prophecy of what he was saying in Luke 17, when the entirety of the question was prophetic? It's to the final generation. He is going to be rejected as the Antichrist. Do you know what they end up saying in the Hadith and in the Muslims' writings? That when his 40 days are over, they believe that the, um, their Messiah, who is the, the, uh, who is, uh, the Mahdi, and their 
prophet who they believe is going to be the Christian Jesus too, that this Jesus is going to kill the other one claiming to be Jesus. So I ask you again, if you're new, who do you think the Son of Man is going to be when he comes for 40 days? How important do you think it is to get this revelation, to get this understanding out to others, whether they believe you or not? That others should hear it. So that whether they're gone, well, they don't have to worry, but if they're here and they weren't accounted worthy, as Luke 21, uh, 36 says, Maybe they'll remember what you told them ahead of time so that when that time comes, they'll remember and believe. It is the Son of Man coming for 40 days when he returns from the wedding. Watch this. As we were talking about the Son of Man being the white horse rider, I can prove it to you more. <clears throat> Let's go. Oh, we can just go right here. Let's go to Matthew 24. The tribulation starts. <coughs> this is the wars and rumors and wars and troubled and so forth. But the real tribulation, according to the, the beginning of the 14 years, is when nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is the beginning of the 14 years. When you go to Mark, it's the same thing. Why? Because destruction in Matthew 24, this nation against nation, begins at Jerusalem. Okay, that, that's what Jesus is here warning about. That when the 50 days are over, when his 40 are over, and then the three and the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes on that, on that remnant worker bride, and they go out from Jerusalem to start spreading throughout all nations, the following day, the compassing about that was taking place by the raven, the attack then comes, at the Feast of Trumpets of 2024 after the 50 days are over. 50 days from the 9th of Av is the 29th of Elul. When that anointing of the Holy Ghost comes and goes and they go out from Jerusalem and people will have been seeing this compassing about happen by Syria and those with Syria, people will be fleeing to the mountains. They won't all make it. Some will be taken captive. Scripture tells us all about it. But those anointed ones, at the end of Elul 29, when they get that anointing at true new wine, they're going to go out to all nations. And the following day, as I said, from that compassing about, Jerusalem is destroyed. That's why you have it in Matthew 24, but you also have it in Mark because it's the beginning of tribulation. Mark says, for nation, against, uh, uh, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then, of course, one has their portion of other events and what follow, and the other one has theirs. So, did you notice something? They both begin with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What does that mean? That means World War III. That's going to begin at Jerusalem, according to what Jesus tells us that he's going to be warning about and what Luke 21 tells us when he's here as the son of man, as the white horse rider for 40 days. He's warning about these things. And what happens? It begins nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What do you think it is? Uh, uh, a love fest and everybody's shaking hands and peace deals? No. This is World War III beginning at the attack on Jerusalem. Peace. Remember what happens right before this? On the 29th of Elul at True New Wine, what happens? The anointing of the Holy Ghost. And then what happens? The Holy Ghost is gone. What happens at that point? Peace is taken from the earth and it becomes nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Let me show you. Look what happens even in the story of Acts. Okay? Or, or sorry. So in relation to that, it's what we covered in, um, in uh, 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 Revelation 6. So you have the 40 days of the Son of Man are done as the white horse rider. 
they were told not many days from now, as we'll cover in a moment, they received the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that true new wine. And then they go out to all nations. They go out from Jerusalem and Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed, which begins nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. The Lord is in heaven again. So he's opened the second seal. And what happened? Excuse me, what happens when he opens the red, the, the second seal? The red horse rider goes out. And what does it say? Power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth. So now the Holy Ghost has just left, right? Peace is now taken from the earth. And what? That they should kill one another. Kill one another. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people against people, city against city. How? By the great sword that's been given. Hello. Mark and Matthew's discourses begin at the red horse rider. The red horse rider is the beginning of the 14 years that starts World War III with the attack and destruction of Jerusalem. The white horse rider is part of the 50 days in that Paul calls above 14 years. It's the story that we read from John in John 20 into Luke 24, into Acts 1, Acts 2. It's the story of Genesis chapter 7 into 8 with the story of the ark. So look at what we see. The Son of Man's 40 days are over in Acts chapter 1. And they're told to go to Jerusalem because they're waiting for the anointing from the Holy Ghost. And they're told not many days hence. That's the three days. What do we know goes out? The Antichrist spirit. The raven goes out. The compassing about by Syria and those with Syria happens. Just as he told them it was going to happen. When you see yourself starting to get compassed about, flee. In fact, I think anybody who, who is listening to the Son of Man at that point should flee right away. Unless you realize that it is the Messiah and you want to follow him, then when he leaves, go out right away. Because destruction is only three days away and your surrounding is going to begin right after he leaves. Not many days hence, it's three days. After what? There's your exact 40 days again. Same as we saw in Genesis, same as we see in, uh, with the story of the ark, same as we see as Noah. And then what happens? We come to Acts 2 and bang, when Pentecost is full come. When is Pentecost? Do you guys realize Pentecost is, of course, new wine? There is no wine ready in spring or the beginning of summer. The grapes aren't even ready. This is why I was telling you earlier, when they talk about, when they talk about um, Savant 6 being Pentecost, that the church calls it Pentecost at the Feast of Weeks, which both are in the wrong place. But still, it cannot be Feast of Weeks. Uh, uh, sorry, Pentecost. You have to understand they're two separate counts, but neither of them have them counted at the right place. And I could prove it to you because uh, Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost comes and anoints them, it's the time of new wine. They're accused of being drunken in this new wine. Well, when is new wine? Everywhere is the same, guys. The Napa Valley, uh, this is just one example. I've shown it from many, many different places. Whether it's Napa Valley, which is very much like the Mediterranean, it's all in the same time frame from around mid-ish uh, September to around mid-ish October in the Northern Hemisphere. Of course, Southern Hemisphere is different, right? The opposite. There, there's no wine ready back in, in May, June, July. It doesn't exist. And we still hear people every day talking prophecy that, that is back at the new wine that's already passed. Guys, this isn't rocket science. Oh, I, I just, all you have to do is search up. When is winter wheat harvested? When's the end of the winter wheat harvest? When is the time of new wine when the grapes are harvested? When, when the time of the end of the grapes harvest comes? And you get your answer. It's everywhere. 
So if this is the time in 2024 of the end of the weed harvest when the two wave loaves are sent, and there's 50 days in this entire count, and when the 50 days are over, it's supposed to be 29th of Elul, when it's new wine, well, guess what? Middish October to around uh, uh, September to around early middish October. That's true new wine. The, the literal harvest that happened on the earth, tell us. That's Acts chapter 2. New wine at Pentecost. It is impossible to have when the grapes aren't even coming out of their vines yet. Awesome stuff, man. Awesome, awesome stuff to understand. So, as I said, coffee. So, what's next? Now Messiah is gone. We saw that he was here for, for a second to let them know. We then saw that he takes the pre-trib group out. He returns on the same day at evening. He anoints by breathing on the apostles. And then he's gone until the eighth day. He returns on the eighth day to see what the apostles did with their anointing during the wedding. And then he goes and meets with those he said to be ready when he returns after the wedding, which means after seven days on the eighth day. He comes, he has a banquet meal with them that he said he would have because they missed the wedding, you see. Not that they missed it, but they were chosen to remain to serve him. Now they have that meal with them, they hang out, they, they get understanding from him during the 40 days. The end of the 40 days comes, he's been warning that Jerusalem is going to be compassed about and attacked and destroyed. He now leaves at the end of the 40 days. Jerusalem and Judah starts to get compassed about. They get the anointing at true Pentecost at New Wine in 2024. They go out then from Jerusalem. From there, go into all nations. And the attack happens at the Feast of Trumpets 2024. The tribulation of the 14 years, even though, quote unquote, the tribulation has begun, the 14 years of tribulation that begin at the Red Horse Rider begin at True Feast of Trumpets 2024. All, of course, tribulation and all these things we've taught on over the years then take place. Then what happens? When does Messiah come again? <clears throat> now, He's coming at the end of the sixth seal. You see, you will have seen many teachings where people take the six seals and the six trumpets and they sandwich them together to say that they overlap and playing all during the same time. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. When you watch that video, it's all because of Matthew. It's all because of Matthew. <coughs> because Christians, their reading, their foundation of understanding for hundreds of years comes from the book that it was written to the Jews, which is the Gospel of Matthew. Hello. They've missed that Mark is to the world, or it's even including the sleeping church, those not prepared and not ready. It's talking to the world, the Gentiles that are grafted into the house of Israel. And Luke is talking to his in Christ spirit-filled bride of Christ. But because this wasn't understood, they believe that everybody is going pre-trib that says they that claims to say I believe in Jesus. What they haven't realized is that puts them really at the end of Mark in the great multitude rapture and the 144,000 sealed and leaves the 7 years of trumpets which is Matthew's gospel. Pretty insane, right? They've missed that Christ and their portion is now going to be the seven years of seals that are connected to the gospel of Mark. Wild. This is how powerful it is when I tell you how important and how, how incredible it is to begin to understand the revelation. So. What you see here now is the end of the sixth seal. So 
when you hear me say the the six seals play out over six years, it's really from the second seal, the red horse rider, until the end of the sixth seal. It's not one seal per year or anything like that. It's just that from the red horse rider to the end of the sixth seal is six years long. That's how it plays out. Not one seal by year. So don't confuse that like that in case uh, you were thinking about that. I used to think maybe that's the way it was at one point too. And then I realized it wasn't. So listen to what it says here now. Now we're talking about all of that pre-trib, above 14 years stuff taken care of. Six years of seals from the Red Horse Rider have played out. We're now at the end of the sixth year of seals. We're right in that time frame of the end of the sixth year of seals. And look at what happens. It says, da, 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 verse 15 of Revelation 6. And the kings of the earth and great men and the rich men and the chief, cap chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Why? And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, comma, and from the wrath of the lamb. Do you think they're seeing something coming? They're seeing, they're witnessing something's coming. Can they all know what it is? Well, it's, it says that hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. <clears throat> but it's not because they're all seeing the lamb. There's just an understanding now of what's taking place. This is the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the, the rock, the, the stone that becomes a mountain. The Antichrist was just ruling for the last 42 months in that second half of seals. And now it's the Ezekiel 39 war and the first battle or sword that the Lord's going to have. We're going to talk about it. This is the end of the sixth seal. This is the end of the first six years of tribulation. Which I believe will start at trumpets 2024, which means what? which means when they see this coming, it's right towards the end of the sixth year, and the very last day of the sixth year would be what? The 29th of Elul of 2030. When are they gonna then see, or the Son of Man coming in the clouds? At the Feast of Trumpets of 2030. How do we know this? Hold on to your horses. Remember what I said in Mark 9? We've got a great video about this. Uh, there was a recent video I did called, um, uh, uh, but of that day and hour. Okay, the one that nobody knows and claims nobody knows. We, we revealed it, we know what it is. Okay, it's not to be a mystery that nobody's gonna understand when. But remember what I told you about after six days, after six days being years in Mark and Matthew? That the, that the days can be years prophetically? Well, listen to what we read here in Mark chapter 9. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here. See, some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen. Very important word. Till they have seen. It's a past tense phrase. The kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, see, there's your picture of your after six years. Who are those that will not taste of death till they will have seen? Remember what we said? Remember what I was saying earlier in, in Mark that Jesus says as the sign of Jonah, they would get no sign and he got in the ship and left? That's exactly it. They had no forewarning. They had no idea that the Son of Man in the clouds was about to suddenly appear. There was no warning for them. So in a past tense, they're gonna have seen it come. You see, they will have seen, they, they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. That's the end of the sixth seal. That's when they see him at the end of those six years, they're gonna see him at the end of the sixth seal come with power. But guess what? The rapture still doesn't happen. That's why it's past tense. They will have seen it, but they still don't know when they're going. 
And that's the story we've shared on many times, which is the spring wheat that I mentioned earlier. Spring wheat is ready in the fall. And when it's harvested, it can't be used until Passover of the following year. That's about midway through the seventh year of seals, right when the rapture happens. Pretty crazy, right? Well, listen to this. We showed those days of years. Look at what we see in Mark 13. Here we are. This is the time of Jesus coming in Mark's, in Mark's portion, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. When they, when they see him and say, rocks fall on us because they're seeing whatever this is, Mount Zion coming. In fact, what is this Mount Zion coming? Well, we know that the Antichrist is going to kill the Antichrist. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But what is this? It's the picture of Daniel chapter 2. The, the whole statue of Nebuchadnezzar. What does it say? See, look at this. But there is in Daniel 2, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealed the secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be, listen to this, in the latter days. Hello. Now what happens? Of course, it's the image of gold and the silver and the arms and all that stuff, right? Listen to what it says in verse 34 and 35. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken uh, to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. Sound like your wheat harvest? Sound like the time of your spring wheat being harvested in that time of the great multitude rapture and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them listen to this here it is and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the end picture of the end of the sixth year of seals when he's seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Watch this. Let's go to continue now in Mark 13. Listen to what it says about the coming of the Lord in Mark 13. In verse 24, it says, but in those days, listen to that, after that tribulation. After that tribulation. What tribulation? What is that tribulation? Seals. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Wait a second. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Revelation 6. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Hello. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. And here we are in Mark 13. And the stars of heaven shall fall. Huh. Can you say end of the sixth year of seals? Verse 26, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. For those of you who have recently watched or if you've been around for a long time, I'm certain you've all seen this. I've got some shorts on it. The, the one short's got a really good number of views uh, for the size of our channel anyways. Hopefully it continues to grow on those shorts. But listen to what it says. At the coming of the Messiah, okay, there it is, verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the the clouds, plural. In, as you know, in Luke, it says they're going to see him coming in a cloud singular. That's not a typo. This word means in, okay? In the clouds, plural. So where is this connection? Well, I just showed you it's the end of the six year seals, stars of heaven falling and so forth. Well, let's see what happens because in Revelation chapter six, at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of that sixth year as well, it says, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, comma, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who's the one sitting on the throne? The Father is. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. 
This is all about Messiah coming at, at mid-tribulation, at the end of the sixth year of seals, for the great multitude rapture, for the sealing of the 144 and the great multitude rapture. See, here's your Assad. Okay, the four beasts, the first one, that's a lion, that's Assad. Assad's last name used to mean beast. And it was either his father or his grandfather changed his last name from meaning beast and changed it to Assad, which means lion. The first beast is a lion. Hello. And that first beast who is a lion is the one that destroys Jerusalem like Jeremiah foretold us. Hello. Okay. So you got your lion, your bear, Russia, I believe Germany, and, and somewhere up through there is the leopard. That's going to be the control center that the beast is going to take over. And there's your fourth one, the beast. And what does the beast have? Ten horns. Those ten beasts that have ten horns are going to be what? They're each going to receive power with the beast one hour, right? Oh, you'll see it. But look what happens at the end of the beast's reign at least for this portion. How long does he get? He gets 42 months. He gets, there's two and a half years of seals from the red horse rider to the, the time frame of as World War III is winding down because Antichrist really steps forward now on the scene with the power and the authority like Revelation 13. And he has 42 months. At the end of 42 months, at the end of the six years, at the end of the sixth seal, bang. What did they see? I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. What did they say at the end of the sixth seal? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, comma, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because he's separate from the Father, right? So the Father, the Ancient of Days who did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head uh, like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels burning a fire. Um, verse 10 of Daniel 7, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. I believe that's the bride that was taken earlier at the beginning. The judgment was set. The books were opened. We're going to talk about this later uh, in another video um, in relation to the book of Gad. It's very interesting. I beheld uh, then... Because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was slain and his body and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away, their dominion taken away, and their lives prolonged for a season and time. Now listen to this. Verse 13. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days huh the clouds plural like marks i shared this recently what is the word with me you see if we don't have a strong concordance at our fingertips we wouldn't know if this is this really connected to luke uh, uh, to mark at the end of seals or at the end of the first six years of seals or is this really talking about something later in trumpets when he comes on the clouds? Well, let's have a look and see. The word with seem from, by, like. Let's go a little bit deeper, see if we can get more insight. In. In the clouds. One like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Isn't that fascinating? And there was given him dominion and glory in, the, in a kingdom. Isn't that fascinating? That out of the three discourses, only marks related to him coming at the end of the six years of seals. Is it in the clouds, plural? Not Luke, not Matthew. It's awesome, awesome stuff. Absolutely incredible. So now what happens? What happens at this point that we saw from Mark 13 at the end of the six years of seals when the, the Ancient of Days did sit and the Lamb is there, the Son of Man, the Lamb coming in the clouds and it's what we were just reading from Mark. What does it say about this period in time? But of that day and hour knows no man. 
Huh. We should all know by now that this idiom, or that this is the idiom, it is telling you the Feast of Trumpets. Everybody should, or at most, know this, have heard of it several times over the years. P.S. This isn't Matthew's, nobody knows the day or hour. This is Mark's, nobody knows the day or hour. What is six years from the Feast of Trumpets 2024? The start of the seventh year, the Feast of Trumpets 2030. Hello. You're following now? That's to the six years. What does he do at this sixth year? We just saw in Daniel chapter 7 that, that the Antichrist is killed. We see the rest of the beast, the rest of them get their dominions taken away. We saw that the beast had 10 horns. Did you know, this is, this is a, such a fun one. I've shared on it many times over the years because it always makes me chuckle. And I don't think anybody, I mean, maybe somebody got a revelation somewhere before, but I had never, ever heard of it before the revelation here. That this incredible prophetic, even though it's something that happened in the is, remember here a little, there a little, what was, what is, both shall be. Listen to this incredible fun story. In Luke 22, verse, starting in verse 35, and he said unto them, when I sent you out, uh, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it and likewise his script that, and he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So he's not talking to a couple guys. He's talking to a group of people right disciples and so forth saying hey whoever doesn't have a sword sell whatever you can and go buy a sword now listen to what they say verse 34 uh, 37 for i say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end okay this is, this is what he says after he tells them to go get swords. Listen to their response after that final verse, after that last verse. Verse 38, and they said, Lord, behold, we have two swords. And what does he answer? He says, all right, that's enough. I have told this a number of times, and it just, could you imagine trying to discern this? He's talking to a group of men to say, hey, if you don't have a sword, go sell your clothes and get a sword. And then he gives them one more verse of information. And it's like during this, they were talking to each other. Hey, hey, do you have a sword? Nah, dude, I, I'm gonna have to sell some clothes. I can't get a sword. I don't have the money for it. And they're like, do you got a sword? No, I don't. Hey, I got one. I got one. Okay, you got one. Okay, you know what? I got one too. Here, here. We'll put our two swords together and let's just ask them. Hey, Lord, behold, we have two swords. And Jesus says, all right, that'll do. <laughs> it's crazy. Just picture it in your head. It's like the funniest thing ever. And Jesus says, okay, that's enough. Do you want to know why? Of course you know what it is, even if you're new. Prophecy. It's all prophetic. The whole thing is prophetic. And this is the battle of one of these swords that he has at the end of the sixth year of seals. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. It's the war from Revelation 17, one of the swords. <coughs> How can we show it? Listen to this. Revelation 17, starting in verse 12. And then, uh, sorry, and the ten horns which thou sawest, hello, didn't we just see that in Daniel, right? The 10, the 10 kings that will receive their appointment, right? And the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, 
but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Isn't that what we saw? The ten horns with uh, the beast in Daniel 7? These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now we're coming. Okay, that's, that's happening during the second half of seals. <coughs> and then it says, these shall make war with the lamb. Well, when did we just see the lamb coming? The time of his wrath at the end of the sixth seal, the sixth year of seals. And the lamb shall overcome them. Listen to this. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. See, he's uppercase Lord over the lowercase lords, and he's uppercase king over the lowercase kings. Do you realize that's even what Antichrist is trying to do? In Daniel 11, it talks about that. Daniel 11 is about the time of seals and Antichrist. And it says that he wants to be God of, of the little g gods. It's not even uppercase gods. <clears throat> the Antichrist is trying to take over Christ's position. And Satan is trying to take over the Father's position. This is the battle against the Antichrist at the end of seals. This is one of those two swords in the picture of why two swords was enough. This is it. This is that battle. Crazy, right? You're going to see how it plays out because you'll see another battle still coming. So this is the end of the sixth year of seals. That final battle. And then what's going to happen? There's going to be the was caught up to paradise. What happens before this was caught up to paradise? Well, here's another example of the was caught up to paradise. Remember the 40 days of the Son of Man? Then he's gone, right? At the end of 40, the raven antichrist spirit goes out, right? Assyria, Assad. Then the dove goes out on the 50th day, anoints them. And then you've got what? Seven years of seals. Seven days as? Seven years. So what happens at the end of that six, right? The time of the seventh? Look what happens in that seventh year. The dove has gone out. In her mouth was an olive leaf, which means branch, plucked off. This is another piece that I talk about in the video I did earlier today that will be out next week. Listen to this. Okay? So what I just explained, and this fascinating piece of scripture, and they stayed yet seven other days, and he stayed yet seven other days. Well, here's the beginning of the 14 years. Look at the word stayed. It means pain. Wounded, pain, sorrow, wreathing in pain. It's all about tribulation. Look at when it says it again in verse 12. And he stayed yet seven other days, which are the seven years of trumpets. The word stayed means wait. Why? Again, this is how important it is to have the, the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips with a program like eSort. No, I don't sponsor them. Or no, I'm not sponsored by them. I promote them because it's fantastic. And so what do we see? There's your seven days as years. And the rapture of the great multitude happens in the seventh year. And look at what it says. And an olive leaf, which means also branch. So an olive branch plucked off. What's the word for plucked in the Greek? Harpazo, rapture. This is the seventh year of seals, great multitude rapture of who? of the Gentiles who were grafted in. It's the branch that was grafted in being plucked off in the great multitude rapture. It is the end of the Gentile age. Hello. Wild stuff, man. Wild, wild, fascinating, beautiful scriptures to be able to understand. <clears throat> it's the same as I said. Those caught up into paradise. The was caught up from what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. It's also the same as Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, when it says, And she brought forth a man child. So this is Christ coming at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This is the great multitude rapture was caught up of the seventh year of seals. It's everywhere.
And then again, of course, we just covered this in uh, Mark 13, the day and hour no one knows. It's telling you it is the Feast of Trumpets. At the end of six years, the seventh year of seals begins at the Feast of Trumpets. He's destroyed the enemy. Antichrist is killed. The rest of them had their dominion taken away. Probably millions of people dead in that battle to come and fight against them. Then what? Then he seals. The 144,000 are now sealed. This is when the sealing of the 144,000 takes place. And it's the Lord doing it and, and whatever help he has. This is when the 144,000 are sealed. It's not the beginning of trumpets. It's the beginning of the seventh year of seals. Remember six days, seventh rest? It's along those lines, okay? That the land is resting now. Now look what happens. We can show it in, in our year counts. We've got the Jubilee all the way back to the year Jesus declared the Jubilee in, when he was here in Luke, uh, in Luke chapter 4. You follow the count from that year, and it equals the Jubilee year in 2038, 2039. Not made up, not guessing, not trying to take this date from that date, but based on Jesus' own words in the year he said them. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. So where are we in this picture of the end of days? Right here. We're at the start of the seventh year of seals, and the start of the seventh year of seals in 2030 uh, yeah, start of the seventh year of seals in 2030 is the Feast of Trumpets. Is the Feast of Trumpets. And what does he do? He's sealing the 144,000. And after he seals the 144,000, they're going to help the other guys that were working during seals. And what are they going to do? They bring in the great multitude rapture. Crazy, right? Don't you think there's a reason why there's a great multitude rapture between the sixth seal and the seventh seal? You think it's put there to tell you, oh, uh, no, it's between the sixth and the seventh, but, but really it's supposed to be uh, uh, pre-trib. No, this is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. It's not the pre-trib. You can find out incredible things. <clears throat> what happens when Christ comes? at the end of the sixth year of seals. What happens when he comes? As we saw him there, we saw him as that, from Daniel 2, that, that stone that became a great mountain. It's him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. What is he, when he comes at that point, and, and he's brought, as we saw, and he's coming in the clouds of heaven. What is he? What does he become? Well, he's, he's the type of, of Joshua, right? Remember, Moses died and Joshua took them over into the promised land. Wow. Joshua, Yeshua. Everyone knows, or most everybody knows, that Joshua is a picture of Jesus. And Moses couldn't take them over. Joshua, Yeshua is the one that takes them over. Well, Look at what we see talked about Joshua, another type of Joshua, as Yeshua Jesus. In Zechariah chapter 6, this is like a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. And what do we see? It says in verse 11 in Zechariah 6, Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, Yeshua. And what does he become? The high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, okay, this is another character, this is actually Zerubbabel, and he shall grow up out of this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. When you go back and read in earlier parts of Zechariah, like Zechariah chapter 4, it's Zerubbabel who is the one who laid the foundation and is the one who's going to finish it. But Joshua Yeshua is the high priest. Who's the high priest? Jesus Yeshua? And when he becomes high priest at the end of the sixth year of seals, to that time frame at the end of seals, what is he high priest? He's now going to be officially high priest and king. He's going to be Melchizedek. And what does it say? 
Okay, so it says, uh, even he shall build the temple, which is the Melchizedek, uh, sorry, which is the Zerubbabel guy, is going to build the temple of the Lord, whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit upon and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. So that means Messiah, who is going to be high priest and king like Melchizedek, who is the one that is directly connected to the father because he is high priest and king, and, Mal and, and Zerubbabel, who's rebuilding, is going to rule with the high priest, but he's still, quote unquote, obviously below the high priest because the high priest is the one directly connected to the father, <coughs> which is Messiah. So what's about to happen? They're about to start to rebuild the temple. Let's prove this out that this is happening first. What about Psalms 10, uh, 110? It says, the Lord, Father, said unto my Lord Jesus, right, the Son, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, Father, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, okay, heavenly Mount Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. You see? Why would he still be ruling in the midst of enemies? Because the tribulation is not over. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Father, Lord Father, has sworn and will not repent. Here it is. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, Christ was a picture of Melchizedek in, in a prophetic way. When Christ was here the first time, he was not high priest King Melchizedek, was he? We know that spiritually he was representing that, of course. But had he actually fulfilled it yet? No. Because the, the real sitting on the right hand of the Father time comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. I'm showing it to you right here, but I can prove it to you more. Look at this timing. This is when he becomes high priest and King Melchizedek. I showed you a picture of when the temple, then they're going to start rebuilding. And it's like the end of the sixth seal talking about now they're going to begin soon to rebuild the temple. You see, this is where the church has been, as I was talking about earlier, gets so mixed up with thinking that the temple must be built first. It's going to be built by Antichrist. Then Antichrist is going to step into it and declare himself God. And they believe that the Jews are going to fall for this Antichrist who builds the temple because they believe it's Antichrist who's building the temple. And it's because they only see the seven years. They're overlaying seals and trumpets. And they're not realizing it's the Son of Man who came at the end of seals. Who will become high priest and King Melchizedek. Who will then be seated at the right hand of the Father. Ruling in the midst of his enemies. And then the temple will be rebuilt by Melchizedek who's ruling with Messiah, the high priest king. You see? The church has missed all of the first seven years of seals. And by combining everything they see prophetic into one seven-year period, they think it's Antichrist who's going to build the temple. Never. Never, ever, never. Hello. The mark of the beast temple that's going to happen during Antichrist seals is the fleshly temple of the people of Christ coming to Christ during seals. It's the mark of the beast in the Moses temple, which was the portable temple, moving temple covered in skin. That is us. That is, that's the flesh still, the people. That's what's happening during seals. Then trumpets comes along, and now the rebuilding of the temple is going to take place. But let me prove to you this time of seating on the right hand of the Father. When it says, 
that then he's going to be high priest and king as Melchizedek. Listen to what it says. Watch this. I think, oh, yeah, I was going to get to it. I'll get to it. In a, oh, you know what? Since I'm there right now, we might touch on it again. But watch this. Let me show you where it is. Remember, I just, we, when we started this, we were in Luke 24, that that was the first worker group that he has a meal with. And in Luke 12, he said there were three groups. The first one was the one ready when he returns from the wedding and he has the meal with them. And, and it's the Luke 24. And they're the ones that receive the anointing at the 50 and then work during seals and so forth, putting their necks on the line and everything else. Remember I said at the end of Mark is the, is the second watch group. And at the end of Matthew is the third watch group. Well, the end of the, uh, the, the second watch group is the 144,000. And they're pictured at the end of Mark's gospel. Just like the first one was in the end of Luke's gospel. Listen to what it says. Then he appeared unto the eleven. Remember, you're seeing with the prophetic end time eyes. That's why there are so many differences. Especially when it comes to the gospels. I mean, you go to the last chapter of each gospel. It is so incredibly different. It's, it's mind-blowing how people were able to say it was the same story the whole way through. And maybe that's why they kept in the story of Matthew the whole time. Because if they would go to Matthew and then go to the same story in Mark and go to the same story in Luke, the whole congregation would have been scratching their head and saying, were these different accounts? It's prophetic. Listen to what it says. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11. This is a picture of the 144, though, okay? As they sat at meat. And he unbraided. Remember I told you about this earlier? He's going to rail on them. For their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So what are we seeing in the prophetic? We're seeing the 144,000 that didn't believe the testimony of those who were the remnant workers during seals from Luke, telling these guys, the Lord is here. Here it is. He's coming. There he is in the clouds. He's coming. And they weren't ready. So. Here he is choosing them and, and he rails on them. But remember, he only sat with and served the meal to the first group. There was only one banquet meal, not found, only found in Luke, not in Mark and not in Matthew. Look at what it said here. They were already sitting and eating. Hello. This is the second watch group. And listen what he tells them. Mark 15, 16. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you realize creature means the world, it's part of the, the days of creation. You'll get it. It's the Mark group. Okay. Uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is power that they're going to be given during trumpets. Okay? During trumpets. This is the power they're going to have. Let me prove it to you. The last two verses. <clears throat> so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, listen to this. He was received up into heaven. Listen to this. And sat on the right hand of God. What did we just read in Psalms 110? The father said unto the son, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He's now in heavenly Mount Zion in that mountain carved without hand that came down. It's the place prepared where the great multitude rapture goes where all their places prepared are in it. And what is he now? High priest and king. When? At the end of Mark's portion of seals, when he's going to now sit officially at the right hand of God, the Father. And it ends in verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Listen to this. The Lord working with them. And confirming the word with signs following. The Lord working with them? Check it out. Revelation chapter 14. The 144,000 
Here's the lamb standing on Mount Zion. What's the Lord doing standing on Mount Zion if he doesn't return till feet down on the Mount of Olives? People will try to tell you everywhere, oh, it was, it was babies that were killed during the time of Christ and they're going to be in heaven and they're going to come back down with them. Really? Then why did he have to seal them born from those on the earth? How would you even know when the 144,000 come that they were all the babies that were under two years old when they were killed 2,000 years ago? What? Scripture tells us. So here's the lamb now on Mount Zion. Why? Because Mount Zion is here. The 144,000 are sealed and they're standing on Mount Zion with the son. With the lamb and the father's name written on them. They sing a new song. Listen to this. They're, they're, they're before the throne. They were redeemed from the earth. And what does it say about them? For these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Is that how you would describe two years old, two year olds that were killed at the time of Christ? They were not defiled with women because they were virgins? That's a pretty harsh description for somebody who was a year and a half, don't you think? Listen to this. Listen to what it says next in Revelation 14, 4. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. Huh. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. And what did it say about when he becomes high priest and King Melchizedek, he sits at the right hand, and what is he doing? The Lord working with them and confirming. When? Wheresoever they goeth, because now they're going to work. This is so awesome. This stuff is so exciting, man. So, so what's another portion of this? Of course, for those who have been around, it's Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, we see this right here. Uh, starting in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. So this commandment to restore is going to happen around the beginning of tribulation, right? Right around, you know, I don't know if it's in that 50 days, right around in that time. So there's going to be a commandment to allow them to go back and rebuild unto Messiah the Prince. But it's going to be seven weeks. Seven weeks of what? Years. What seven years? The seven years of seals. So we saw what takes place during the sixth. We see him come at the end of the sixth. He destroys the enemies that came against. He seals the 144,000. The great multitude rapture happens. He is now high priest and king Melchizedek. And Zerubbabel is there. And the rebuilding is about to take place. Which will start at the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. So what? The first seven weeks or seven years. They didn't actually get to rebuild the temple. And then you have comma and three score in two weeks, which is about three and a half years. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And you find out, yes, and the temple too. Of course, we, ju we just read it. We just read it in Ezekiel. I mean, in Zechariah. When he becomes high priest and king. And Zerubbabel is going to be the one to rebuild it. Well, while Yeshua is seated at the right hand and he's high priest and king. Melchizedek. And what's going to happen during those first about three and a half years of trumpets? That means Messiah is here. Messiah is here as high priest and king. He'll be here from around that time frame of trumpets of 2030. <clears throat> He'll be here for that entire seventh year of seals. Sealing the 144, we saw it just right there in Revelation 14. We saw the connection to the end of Mark, uh, Mark 16. We know that then the great multitude rapture comes in. We know he was that stone and then it becomes a great mountain. This is all about the end of the sixth year of seals, and there's one more year. So the 144,000 sealed, then they're there with, on Mount Zion. You see the great multitude rapture coming, and then there's still the seventh seal, which is about the rest of the, the second half of the seventh year of seals. Then what happens? Then, then begins 
the first about three and a half years of trumpets while Messiah is here. That's exactly what it tells us in Daniel 9, 26. And after three score and uh, two weeks, which is about three and a half years, shall Messiah be cut off. This just isn't any anointed one like Cyrus was anointed or people are anointed. It's actually Messiah. This is the entirety. This is what I'm showing you. That Messiah is going to be here for the final year of seals and for the about first half of trumpets. Before what? When they have finished rebuilding the temple, then he's going to get cut off. Why? Not for himself, because of the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. How long is this period of time? It's two and a half years. I'm going to show it all to you in the next reasonable amount of time. <laughs> okay? So Messiah is here. So he's actually here for about four and a half years from the end of the first six years of seals. I just showed you where he was. Revelation even said he was there on Mount Zion with the 144. Listen to Zechariah 8. Zechariah 8 is the beginning of trumpets. And look at what we see. Here's the father. Thus saith the Lord, father of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy and, for great, and with great fury. And then he says what? I am returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. What holy mountain? Zion, the one that he came on that was a stone that became a great mountain that they're seeing coming at the end of the sixth year of seals? What's he doing on Mount Zion when we've been told he doesn't return till feet down on the Mount of Olives? So now he's here. This is now the beginning of the seventh year of tribulation or the, the, the beginning of the eighth year. The seven years of seals are over. When do you think this is? Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets of 2031. You see? Let's go look at the picture again. Feast of Trumpets 2031. Right here. Feast of Trumpets 2031 to Feast of Trumpets 2032. It goes from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. Here he is on Zion. Listen to what it says. Okay, in verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Now listen to this. This is fascinating. I love these next two verses. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid. When does it happen? This Only the foundation is going to get laid during seals, okay? In the midst of seals, okay? When the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, that the temple might be built. See, now let your hands be strong because the temple is about to be built. Exactly. Zerubbabel, this modern day end time Zerubbabel, is the one who's in charge of rebuilding the temple on the foundation that he had done during the time of seals before they were interrupted and could no longer finish. Now do you see? Now do you see where, where the church has told you it's only seven years and they're saying Antichrist comes first and he's going to build the temple? No. It's because they've sandwiched seals and trumpets over each other when they're supposed to be two separate seven-year periods of time, like everywhere throughout Scripture tells us. So the beginning of trumpets is when they're going to start rebuilding the temple. Listen to what it says in verse 10. For before these days there was no man for hire, nor any beast, uh, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace. Wow. When was peace taken? At the red horse rider, the beginning of trumpets, uh, the beginning of tribulation. 
neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. The tribulation that began when? When peace was taken. And what did he do when peace was taken? What does the red horse rider tell us when peace is removed? For I said, all men, everyone against his neighbor. Of course, it was the father that did this. Who is the one who releases the red horse rider? The Lord is the one that breaks the seal. The peace is removed from authority in heaven and the great sword is given from the authority of the father in heaven. It releases affliction, tribulation on the earth and sets what? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people against people. There was nobody to start rebuilding the temple for the first seven years because of the tribulation of seals. And now trumpets begins. Let your hands be strong and get ready because it's trumpets, it's temple building time. It's the Lord here rebuilding or overseeing the rebuilding while he's heading the 144,000 connected to the father, of course, as high priest and King Melchizedek. Zerubbabel, who is ruling with him, is ruling in the rebuilding of the temple at the beginning of trumpets. Wow, the Lord is here. Just like Daniel 7 said. Okay, so this takes you all the way. It's going to take you to, to the, let's, the rebuilding and all this stuff is happening. Now, what's happening in other places around the world? Well, the first four trumpets are still going off. There's some pretty hairy things going on during the first four trumpets in different parts of the world. A third of this dying, a third of that dying. It, it's pretty crazy. Well, don't forget what it said. He's, he would what? Rule in the midst of his enemies. So this is happening during the first three and a half years. While the 144,000 are out doing their, their, their ministering and their preaching. They have power and authority. But then what happens? Well, now it's time for the what Daniel 9 said, where Messiah is going to be cut off. And where does Messiah get cut off? Right here in Trumpets. At Matthew's abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation in Mark is the, is the flesh mark of the beast one. The reason I didn't really go into it is because we're talking about the time when Christ is going to be here and things that will be happening. This one right here in Matthew 24 is the abomination of desolation that happens in about the middle time of trumpets. That's why it's stand in the holy place where Mark says stand where it ought not. It relates to the mark of the beast in Mark. But in Matthew, what has happened during the first half of trumpets? They've rebuilt the temple. So he's now actually going to be standing in the holy place. And this is when there's this flee from Judea again into the mountains. This is actually the um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. This is the time when in Revelation 12, 14, at the cutting off that happens, because why? Because Satan has lost his battle against Michael and his angels. And he's now being cast out. Satan and his angels are being cast out. This is after the fourth trumpet. This is the, the fifth trumpet or the first woe that scripture tells us. This is when Messiah gets cut off. And when Satan is cast down, the pit is opened. And when the pit is opened, Antichrist, outside of all these other creatures that come out, Antichrist is returning. Pretty wild stuff, isn't it? This is why in Revelation 17, you see that he was, because he was during 42 months of seals, then he is not, because the first half of trumpets, he was killed, right, at the end of seals. So that the first half of trumpets, he is not, because the Lord is here during the rebuilding of the temple and everything. And then... He shall be when he comes out of the pit. That's at mid-trumpets when Satan's cast down right here. Satan's cast down just like in, is it uh, Revelation 9? At the fifth trumpet, he's cast down and the bottomless pit is opened. Who comes out of the bottomless pit? 
the Antichrist. We read it that when the one that comes out of the bottomless pit, you see, in Revelation 11, 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, so when the two witnesses, we're not going to get into that, have finished their testimony, which is the end of the 1260 days, the about three and a half years, the first half of trumpets, it says the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. We already saw he was killed at the end of six years of seals. So he wasn't around for the first half of trumpets. And now the pit is going to be open when Satan is cast down. And the beast is going to come up from the bottomless pit. It's exactly what Revelation 17 told us. When? At the first woe. The first woe is the fifth trumpet. This is when Messiah is cut off. This is what Daniel 9 is talking about. This is even what Zechariah 11 is talking about. In Zechariah 11, it says, uh, The cedars of old, cedar fallen mighty. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. Satan is now being cast down. The pit is going to be opened. Antichrist is going to return. And what does Messiah now have to do? Remember, he makes a covenant at the end in that seventh seal. He makes a covenant. He makes a covenant at that time frame of the start of trumpets when he's high priest in King Melchizedek. And what does it say? By mid trumpets here for Zechariah 11. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people. And it was broken in that day. Why? Because Messiah is being cut off at mid trumpets, brothers and sisters. At mid trumpets, he's being cut off, which is in the fourth year. <clears throat> it's three years and change. So whether it's the tail end of 2034 or the early part of 2035, just like Zechariah 11, one, two, three, and a part of 11. That's about three and a half years. Are you following this? This is fascinating stuff. We're seeing all of these portions of them. All of this time and this period of when he gets cut off. And when he gets cut off, how do we know how long it's going to be for? We've talked about this a number of times as well. <clears throat> but this is something that everybody has messed up when it comes to prophecy. In uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, halfway through, you know, and how long shall it be? And it says that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no word and between time and times. There's no word and. But in Revelation chapter 12, there was. Remember when they fly? Remember I was telling you the abomination of desolation that takes place in Matthew? It's connected to when Satan is cast down. And Revelation chapter 12, 14, when they fly away on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness. And it says for a time and times and a half. That means one plus two plus a half. This is a total of the final three and a half years of trumpets. Which means right to the end of the 14 years of tribulation. But that's not what, that's not what uh, Daniel 12 says. Daniel 12 says, how long is this going to be, this craziness that's at hand? How long is this going to, is going to take? And he tells him for time, times, and a half. That's one, two, plus a half. That's only two and a half of the final three and a half years of, tri uh, of trumpets. <laughs> Meaning, Satan and his time is only going to go for two and a half years of the final three and a half. And we know that that equals to the end of the sixth year of trumpets or the end of the 13th year of trumpets from Feast of Trumpets of 2024. What is this time, times, and a half? When is this two and a half years done? It says, when he will have accomplished to scatter the people, uh, the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Do you know when all these things shall be finished? Listen to this. 
in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Same kind of conversation that was being had in Daniel. Okay? His, his foot on the sea and in the, in, the, in the earth and so forth. And look at what it says. In verse 7 of Revelation 10. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, what does this mean? As soon as that seventh angel puts the lips to the trumpets to blow that seventh trumpet at the, at the start of the seventh year, it says, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What did Daniel 12 say after the two and a half years? All things shall be finished. That means there's one year left. That takes us to what? The end of the 13th year of tribulation, or for trumpets, it takes us to the end of the six, hello, days as years. Remember Mark had six days as years in the picture of the Lord in the transfiguration? And then Matthew had six days as a typology of years in his transfiguration? It's now the end of the 13th year, and guess what? It's the end of 70 in 2037 from when they captured all of Jerusalem in 1967. They have now completed the 70 years at the end of 13 years. Now what, what's happened? The seventh trumpet is about to sound at what? The Feast of Trumpets. And what happens in this final year? It's the day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, like Isaiah 34 and, and 61 tell us. It's the final, it's the day of the Lord. That's the year of his vengeance. Isn't this crazy stuff? Just beautiful to understand. Shouldn't it equal the Feast of Trumpets? Well, lo and behold, we go to Matthew 24 and look at what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. What did Mark say immediately after that tribulation? Here's now immediately after the tribulation of those days. Sun shall be darkened, stars not nah, nah, give her light. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes. Remember I said at the end, it's the 12 tribes. Then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. What? In the clouds? I know you guys know this, but I got to show it still. Remember what I said when you have the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips? You can really know what the words are saying. Is he really telling them the Son of Man at this point, at the sound of a great trumpet? Hello. With a great sound of a trumpet? Isn't that when the seventh trumpet begins to sound? Exactly. How could you not be crazy excited about this stuff? Okay, 24 verse 30, the end of it. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Is it in? No. The actual word is different. It's actually on. Why? Because this is when they shall see him. Like I said, Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Isn't that exactly what he said in Luke chapter 17? But then said, whoa, before that day, this is coming first. Well, now we have gotten to the end, to that final year of tribulation, that 14th year of trumpets, that, that seventh year of trumpets, the 14th year of tribulation, and Satan's time has come to an end. He got two and a half years, and the Lord is now going to fulfill that final year when, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he's going to be seen coming in the clouds, and what do they say? But of that day and hour knows no man. When is that? Feast of Trumpets 2037 begins the final 14th year. 
Want me to prove it to you? This is something we've been sharing quite a bit lately. Jeremiah 25 tells us, and I'm so close to being done, I can't believe I've done it within a reasonable time because this is just action Jackson, man. This is craziness. Watch this. What did the Lord would tell them would happen when they accomplished 70 years? In Jeremiah 25, 12, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, and the Chaldees with perpetual desolation. Listen to what he says. He's now going to make them drink the cup of the wine of his fury. Okay, they're going to drink it. He's going to have them, all these nations are to drink of it. And what does he call it when this happens? He's going to make them all drink it because he's got to bring the sword against them. If he started by allowing it to come against his people to correct them, he certainly is not going to allow the enemy to just willy-nilly through to the end and everything's fine. No, now at the end, after 70 years are accomplished, he is going to bring destruction upon them and he's doing it with the wine. And what does he say about it? Listen to this. Jeremiah 25, 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. Remember, that's how it starts the tribulation, the 14 years. And should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. See, all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, now what sword is it? Was it the first, the second, right? Wh which sword? You'll find out. Therefore, prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar from his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. When is this treading of the grapes? Well, we've been covering it quite a bit lately. But remember, there was a reason why I told you Luke 22, he had two swords. He used one at the end of seals, right? At the end of the six year seals. Well, now he's about to use one at the end of six years of trumpets or that start of the seventh year of trumpets. Listen to this. Okay, he brings that sword. So what happens if we go to Zechariah 14? There was your start of trumpets. Here's your seventh year of trumpets or 14th year of tribulation. And listen to what it tells us. The day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? The year of his vengeance. Remember Luke 17? When he'll come as lightning from one end unto the other. The day and hour, Matthew said, no one knows. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. It'll be that his day. What does it say about it? Verse 2. Actually, uh, verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Listen to this. As when he fought in the day of battle. As when he fought in the day of battle. When was that? The first sword. Revelation 17. The end of the sixth year of seals. The, 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 the Ezekiel 39 war. Him coming with the mountain carved without hand. This is the as when he fought in the day of battle. And what is he doing now? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. That's the second time. When is he going to do it? Verse 4. He'll stand on the Mount of Olives in that day. When is this day? Check it out. Revelation 19. Remember, it had to be after the accomplishing of 70 years, which means the final year is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And when he comes, what is he going to do? It's the treading of the grapes. Well, check it out. Here it comes. Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war his eyes were as flame of fire and on his head were many crowns see remember he was given many crowns at the end of seals and he had a name written that no man knew but himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood 
and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed with linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword, uh, sorry, goes a sharp sword, uh, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You see, in, in Psalms, he didn't get to rule with a rod of iron yet. In Psalms 110, when he became high priest and king, he wasn't yet ruling with a rod of iron. He sent out the 144,000 who were doing that ruling with the rod of iron. Okay, and now it says, now he's gonna, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on the thigh a name written, all uppercase this time, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the second sword. This is when he's returned on the Mount of Olives at the Feast of Trumpets 2037, at the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet, at the end of the two and a half years of Satan in the pit having been opened and all the craziness, when he cut off his, his uh, um, covenant. This is that final year. Remember, they flew away on the wings of an eagle until the end of the final three and a half, which is the end of the 14. Why? Because they're remaining there in that place protected until this final 14th year, which is the Lord raining down destruction on the enemies over all the earth, that their flesh will consume away where they stand upon their feet and their eyes will consume away in their holes and their tongues will consume away in their mouth, it says. Those in Judah, in Jerusalem, will fight against the others. You follow? This is the end, that final year. And what did scripture say? After they have accomplished 70 years, then will be the final year. What are these sevens? They're Shemitah years, right? Seven, 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 seven. Well, guess what? Look at when the last Jubilee was in the new cycle, 1989 to 90. When we go all the way back to the time of Christ, when he made the declaration in, in Luke chapter four, he was declaring that the following year was a Jubilee. When you follow and count this Jubilee, because every when every 50th year is the first year of the new 49 year count. Look what happens. Look what happens. The final Jubilee is 2038 to 2039, the Jubilee year and the beginning of the millennial reign after he's completed the final seventh year Sabbath. What does it mean now when he's completed this final year? Remember I said there was a third watch group? There was still that third watch? What does it mean? Now when this final year is over, they're gonna be brought back from the wilderness. Like Ezekiel 30, uh, 48 says, they will all be given their division of land. Even at the start of 47 of Ezekiel, the Lord is there, he's gonna replenish the earth. It's going to be renewed. Isaiah talks about it as well. He's going to repair, renew the earth. The tribes will come and receive their portions of land and their promised millennial reign will begin. Which means what? He is now going to be here with them till the end of the world. Till the end of the millennial reign. Who's he doing this with? Let's go to the end of the story. Matthew chapter 28, the third watch group. Listen to this commission, different than Luke, different than Mark. Matthew 28, verse 16. Uh, then the 11 disciples, remember, it's a typology, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. That's nothing what the others say. And when they saw him, 
they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in the earth. Well, isn't that fascinating? Do you know what happens at the seventh trumpet? Listen to what it says at the seventh trumpet. And the seventh trumpet sound. Remember, the mystery of God will be finished at this point, right? And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Back to Matthew 28. As we wrap it all up, there he is now declaring that all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. And in 19, Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Have you ever wondered why it's teach all nations and not preach anymore? Mark said preach. Matthew said, uh, uh, Mark said preach. Luke said preach. Only Matthew says teach. Why? Because the whole world will have seen him come as lightning from one end unto the other. That final year of trumpets is the year that Matthew chapter 24 describes as the days of Noah in Matthew 24. Not the one from Luke as we described earlier, but the Matthew 24. It's the final year as the picture of the one of Noah. And when that final year is done, then he has the Matthew 25 wedding. That's why Matthew 25 has the wedding and then the coin. And, and what did they do during that time? And then what? Then they're cast out, right? The weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the 14 years are over, it'll be the seven-day wedding of tabernacles. And the millennial reign will begin and it will be declared first before the wedding at the feast of atonement at the feast of atonement they will declare the jubilee after the lord had returned and destroyed the enemies from trumpets of 37 to trumpets of 38 from trumpets of 38 10 days later which is why noah's story is a year and 10 days to coincide with Matthew's final year of a year from trumpets to trumpets and then 10 more days to declare the final jubilee is now at hand. And at the Feast of Tabernacles of 2038, well, from, yeah, of 2038, in that final year, right here, when this is over, at the Feast of Tabernacles of 2038, in the beginning of the jubilee, will be the wedding of Matthew chapter 25, the Jewish wedding. And listen to what he tells these guys. They're now teaching because the whole world knows that he's here. They no longer need to, to preach about Jesus. So they're going to go out teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You see, the whole world has been arguing whether it should be this baptism or the baptism of, of Acts chapter 2, verse 30-something. It's not this one. This one is for the end of days. This one is for the millennial reign. We should all be baptized in Acts chapter 2 version. And listen how it ends. This is so powerful when you understand it. Remember the third watch goes out during the millennial reign? This is what he's telling that third watch. It says, and they're now to go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, listen to this, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why do you think it says the end of the world? Why do you think it's the third watch group that goes out during the millennial reign? to teach the ways of the Lord as he commands them. And Jesus is here until the end of the world because he has now returned. The final year is complete and they are going out during the millennial reign and he is with them until the end of the millennial reign, the end of the world.
brothers and sisters, this stuff is so, it's gangster, man. This, this is so, so, so beautiful. It is, it is so incredible. God is so merciful and great. His spirit is leading like has never, ever been revealed in human history before. And for some reason, we have been chosen to receive it and to understand it. If, if this was too much for you to take in in one watch, pause along the way, rewind, take your time, absorb it, see and understand all of these portions of time of Christ. It's absolutely way beyond anything you have ever been taught in a seven year tribulation. It's not even close. So if you have ever wondered why things didn't seem to make sense in seven years, why it seemed there was maybe different types of groups, now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Take the time, go into those the, the playlist, either here on YouTube or on the intro page on Ministry Revealed and witness for yourself the truth of the entirety of the revelation. These are the comings of Christ Jesus as the Son of Man, Lamb, our Messiah, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I do all of this not by myself, but by the power of the Holy Ghost leading me. There is no way a guy like me, or I would submit anybody for that matter, could have ever received such revelation over all of these years without the authority of the Father instructing the Holy Ghost to make it so and lead it through. We will be here right to the end. So please, if this coming season ahead of us in the next couple of weeks comes and goes, I hope I'm wrong and it does come. But if it doesn't, please be strengthened. Please know we are here and we will continue to receive you. We will continue to pick you up. We will continue to encourage and strengthen because there is nothing more incredible, nothing that fills you with more joy than suddenly being able to realize something in revelation that you never understood before. It lights a fire in you as it has me for six years and many others. And you know what happens? You get more diligently digging into him. Exactly as he qualified Enoch in faith, loving the Lord to do so, to be accounted worthy, to escape all these things that shall come to pass at the true feast of weeks, which I believe will be 2024. We will encourage and strengthen and do what we can do until that time. God bless you. God bless your families. I love you all dearly. And we will see you soon. Bye for now.